Good morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. some sort of strange sound in the background. I don't know if the, the kids and cubs can hear it or not, but there's some sort of bizarre noise going on. I don't know what that that's all about. Uh, we're going to bring up the Lola cam here, though, because uh, she is seated beside me right here. There's the Lola cam. There's the Lola cam. Lola. Lola. Hi, sweetheart. Hello. Oh. <laughs> I love Lola Vision. <laughs> ah, that's great. Ah, yes. Uh, for those of you who watch that, you just watched me slide right on in. <laughs> well, good morning. And hello, kids. Is something wrong? Yeah, just give me a second. Let me check something here. Okay. Hearing crazy noise. It might just be in my end. Just a second. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to have to get you to log in and log out because it's there's some sort of bizarre noise coming along and I have no idea what's creating it. So just jump in, jump back out, and uh, hopefully that'll fix it. Usually, usually that is the cure. I'm running uh, some AI software today on my camera, so if I look a little bit herky-jerky, it's because the AI is doing something. It's supposed to make the image look better. I don't know. You tell me if it does or not. It's still there. I don't know what's going on. might be... Uh, yeah, it sounds like a scratch, 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 scratch. Uh, okay, uh, I can oh. reboot. Yeah, yeah, let's reboot because when you speak, it gets even worse. <laughs> I don't All know right. what's causing it. There's some, there's a, there's a gremlin in the machine. It happens sometimes. So yeah, just do a hard reboot, and uh, I'll, I'll be here when you get back. I mean, hey, well, we're already a few minutes late, so what's the big deal? You know, <laughs> we'll be okay. I do have. While you're doing that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna regale the folks with a. Uh, a story from the Beaverton. For those who have not yet seen this, I think it's a pretty good one. If you know, just there you go. He's just rebooting now. So here's a story from the um, from the Beaverton, which I think is quite funny. It's uh, oh, I guess when did this come out? I guess it was last night, I believe. It says wealthy Canadians demand the Liberals also raise taxes on the capital gains of the poor. You see, here's the funny thing. <laughs> This is uh, art, but it is imitating life because there was an article written by 150 CEOs and tech leaders that said this is damaging for Canadians. And then I pointed out that all of Scandinavia would disagree with you. And I've showed people um, documents that, that dictate that higher capital gains taxes have actually improved productivity and increased it over the years. But hey, you know, empirical evidence, be damned. So, from Ottawa, after learning the new federal budget will increase the amount of tax paid by people who make more than $250,000 in capital gains in a year, Canada's richest citizens are demanding their sacrifice be matched by an equal sacrifice from Canada's poorest citizens. 
Why should I have to pay more just because I have more? Asked Bruce Wilmington. Wilmington? Williamton? Williamton the third. Let's try that again. Why should I have to pay more just because I have more? Asked Bruce Williamton the third, the multimillionaire heir to a grocery store empire. I work hard both to be born and not to be disinherited despite my reprehensible behavior. It is ridiculous that now I have to pay higher taxes on the money that my money makes for me. I demand that when one of my cashiers who works for my family's company sells her car because she can't afford gas for it anymore, her profits from that sale should be taxed at the same at the same higher rate that I'm now paying when I sell several of my classic cars because I'm bored with them and also my license has been revoked again. It's only fair. Canada's money cl- moneyed class is vehement that any sacrifice they are expected to make to help the government pay for the increase in costs of housing, health care, and environmental disasters be shared equally by everyone or ideally by mostly born by the lower classes who haven't figured out how to hire their own lobbyists. <laughs> it's downright criminal to increase my taxes. I'm an ordinary middle class guy, said James Howard, an investment banker. I toil day and night, three hours a day, four days a week, just to be able to afford a vacation home for every member of my family. If the government wants to increase the taxes, I pay on the immense profits that I make when I sell one of those vacation homes. They should, all, so, they should also be increasing the taxes the lower class pays on the minor profits they make when they sell their own vacation homes or shacks or tents or whatever the poverty-stricken some are in. Frankly, taxing the poor makes a lot more sense from a psychological perspective, Howard explained. Someone who already doesn't have much money is used to what little they have being taken from them. They'll handle it better. Whereas I am literally insane with rage at the thought of paying slightly more in taxes. And I will take it out on the next person I see who can't fight back because of the economic power I hold over them. At press time, the point, the 0.13% of Canada's population that the increased tax effect we're being assured, Pierre Polyev, that when he's prime minister, he'll close as many hospitals as it takes to get their taxes back down to a level they will still bitterly complain about, but slightly less so. See, here's the funny thing. <laughs> that really is art imitating life in, in ways that I, I just, it's bizarre, the behavior of people these days. There's, there's a little, oh, that's a mic cable right there hanging off my chair. Little Lola just sleeping by my feet. She's got some nail polish stain on her bed. Poor thing. But that article from the Beaverton, I know it's a humor satirist magazine, uh, publication, um, well, publication magazine. I don't think they have a physical copy. I think it's just only virtual. And there is a, they have a YouTube channel and obviously a blog. The thing is, though, I've... Even though it is satirical, I have heard people with money complain about this so close to the line of what was written in that article that it's kind of disturbing. It's really disturbing. I don't want to pay it. You know how much money I paid last year? I go, yeah, it's more than I earned. I think you're doing okay. I work hard for my money, and I don't for mine. My 75-hour weeks aren't enough. I'm like, come on, people, get with the program. Okay, sir. You are. Am I with yeah. you? Yeah, it's, you're here. I don't know what the sound is. I don't know where it's coming from, but we'll worry about it some other time. Let's just get on with the program, sir. Okay, but is it, does the sound, Ooh. like, is it hard to, okay, I'll move to the phone. Yeah, sorry, man. I don't know what's going on. Uh, oh, you know what? Let's try this. Let's try this real quick. Unplug and plug the mic back in. Yeah, let's try that. Let's see if this fixes it. it definitely kills it for a f- second or two. Okay, might have to restart the Unify software. Uh, oh, there we are. It's good. Is that better? Yeah, perfect. Yay! Solved it. Solved it. There we go. Okay. When in doubt, jiggle it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm leaving that one alone. <laughs> <laughs> That's, hey, we turned it off and on, we rebooted it back and forth, and then all we did was pull it in and out. So, I'm just saying. <laughs> hey, jiggle man, it, 
just, just a, a little, little bit. bit. I want to see you jiggle mm-hmm. it just a little bit. I said, boo. Okay. Uh, I haven't heard let's that try that again. About 100 years. I know. I love Oh, man. When that song said wiggle it and I got on the dance floor, man, did I ever wiggle it. I think I lost five pounds every time I danced <laughs> to that song just from shaking my hips around and around and around and around. Uh, oh, love yeah. that. I love that song. Yeah, it was great. Oh, yeah, that that, that was my jam. <laughs> when it nice, nice. Um, I, I I was um I was uh, said that to, you know if I have ever had a a rap battle with a Kit James, you know it's like um yeah nobody's gonna believe I'm gangster so you know all the rap songs I would sing would be stuff like uh, jiggle it or push it or <laughs> I got the power because <laughs> it certainly wasn't gonna be that. <laughs> I got, I got, I get all the ladies and drive a Maserati. They won't even let me have a driver's license. So you know, I'm not living the lifestyle. I hate flossing and balling. <laughs> I'm doing homework and making sure food gets on the table. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh man. Okay. Well, good morning and hello kids and welcome to season three and episode number oh my god that is just so cute 364 oh lola vision <laughs> i love this <laughs> i wish we had like have voices yes good morning kids who come hi it's me lola <laughs> um she's just so adorable of the daily beaver morning show uh here on the cryo media network yay Today, recording day is Friday, oh, April nineteenth, twenty twenty four. Yes, thank goodness. Thank goodness. Yeah. It's been a heck it, of a week. It's been a week indeed. Uh, I'm your host, the Eager Beaver. Pronounce he, him, hey, Mister Beaver, hey. and with me, as always, as you could definitely hear, is <laughs> Mister Grizzly. Uh, big thank you goes to our podcast founding sponsors, the Pepper Master, the Miss V Mysteries from Corby Moon Publishing. And CanadianTarot.com. And yes, Saucy, I agree. Rhythm is a dancer is always a good one. Uh, it's a banger. It's a banger. Uh, so before we continue any further, because everything's out of order today, let's ask Mr. Grizzly how his mental health is doing today. <laughs> um, really good, actually. <laughs> really good. Um, surprisingly good. I, I don't know. I'm not going to question it, man. I'm just I'm feeling good. Um, I was really tired when I woke up this morning, but uh, I took uh, took Miss Little Miss Lola out for a little walk, and uh, yeah, feeling better, feeling better. I think I think having this this um, eighty pound muscle bound love hound, uh, which is what she is, um, in in my periphery, and uh, oftentimes she just like I don't know because Bridget uh, stayed at her place the last two nights because she was spending time with her daughter. The, um, this little thing crawled into bed with me at midnight and slept at my feet. And I'm like, okay, I'll just, you know, <laughs> 6 a.m. She wakes up, comes up, licks my face. Let's go outside. <laughs> she's a character. Oh, love her. Love her. So oh, yeah, she's, she's really good for my mental health. Even, even when I've had a rough day, um, you come home to that. I, I want to say smiling face, but it's not that furry face and it, uh, it picks you up, you know, it helps you out. It really does not to diminish my beloved or anything. It's just, the dog does the same thing for her. Mm-hmm. You know, dogs do that for people. They just, they bring out the best in you. Mm-hmm. Yes, they absolutely do. Oh my word. Yes, we are uh, sharing uh, music today. Moan, shake that thing, Miss Donna. Jody and the one Rebecca. <laughs> I love that. Ah, I love it, love it, love it. Uh, that's a, that, that was another song that was a that was a good jam of mine there. All right, kids and cubs. Uh, I apologize for being late. Have no excuse really. Uh, the alarm rang at six thirty. I turned it off, but for some reason didn't manage. Fell asleep before I got out of bed. And uh, yep, <laughs> uh, Paul. Mr. Grizzly gave me a call just as I was stumbling out of bed. So uh, you're getting uh, fresh out of bed, uh, Beaver, today. So there you go. Yes, Sean Paul, indeed, Toronto Dan. Um, uh, So I I apologize and thank you for your patience. Um, We have our usual Friday show for you today. Um, 
we're still going to talk a little bit about the budget because uh, there's a couple of things we didn't uh, get out yet, and then uh, we will be moving to other topics. But uh, as Mr. Grizzly mentioned by uh, mentioning that story on the uh, of about in the Beaverton, uh, you know, satire, but only barely, barely satire. Because I mean, we did see said you know people on Bloomberg. Uh, you know, saying, oh my God, I sold my company for $500 million and I can't believe I have to pay. You know, it's like, okay, yeah, whatever. Uh, and then you have all these people on, online going, it's like, oh my God, I'm going to sell my house before June 25th. It's like, and again, as we told you yesterday, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. No, actually go ahead. We have a housing uh, supply well, yes. shortage right now. So go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, but, uh, you know, you don't need to sell your house and you will not be paying capital gains on your house and on your principal residence and, you know, all these types of things. And then, you know, it's like, oh, my God, you know, what about the doctors? And it's like, eh, yeah. you know, Suddenly they're concerned about doctors. Yeah, suddenly they're concerned about doctors. Um, like, where was the concern when they weren't getting, they were trying to get a, a pay increase? Yeah. Well, so, so much, not so much like doctors itself, but as, it, you know, independent people who are, who are corporations themselves mm, so, because mm. doctors, your doctor's office, you know, is often, you yes. don't have to like this, but most doctors do, uh, or not most, I don't know. Sorry. Let me take that back. Cause I don't know if most is, I would assume most is, but enough, you know, for there to be a lot, um, actually, you know, actually start their own, um, you know, businesses, uh, as part of their, their doctor's office. Yes. Um, and then that sense, you know, there, there's a, there's eligibility for capital gains and, and that type of stuff uh, in, in that sense. Uh, you know, so well, what about if I reinvest in my own company? Well, you know, there are benefits to that. That, that goes well. If you, you know, investing in your own company, you tend, you know, to do better on that money uh, than, you know, in other situations. So it's, um, how do you put it? it there's a lot of whining, there's a lot of crying, and as we mentioned yesterday, for the uh, proportionality, considering, you know, uh, with regard to the indigenous community, there's an infrastructure deficit of about, the community at least evaluates it at about $420 billion across Canada. And they got what they got, and then the disability community I was hoping for at least a $1,000 top-up, was ended up getting 200 Mm-hmm. So, so there you got, so, and then you had, you know, the richest, uh, the owners of the richest 300,000 uh, companies and trusts in Canada and the 40,000 individual Canadians making a, an average of one point more, $4 million in income a year. Right. You got that small group of people. And uh, it seems that that group of people got more coverage, got more press, got more sympathy, got more everything. Than the think of the millionaires and billionaires. So, Won't you think of the millionaires and billionaires? Yeah. So the airwaves, the airtime, the whatnot, clearly money buys it. Clearly. Even the free, the earned media, because they, it's not like they, they, it's not like they pooled all their money and took out ads and said, no. Hey, let us pay to try to gaslight you that it would be wrong to make us pay more. Let's, no, let's just be guests on Bloomberg and all the shows and the news and stuff like that, that, you know, have us on and carry our message for free. Mm. Right. And, and, and let's be so many of us going, Oh my God. And yelling and screaming that, uh, you know, uh, you know, and everybody knows who we are, especially, you know, if you're on Bloomberg and you're a CEO oh, of a company, yeah. they know who you are. Right. As opposed to, uh, let's say, uh, you know, uh, some of the members of our chat, who happen to be disabled mm-hmm. and just go on social media and go, oh, I like this. Well, people from Bloomberg are not looking for that, not scanning your accounts, right? You're not being invited. Exactly. Right. I think that Toronto Dan, um, made, uh, uh, um, made an audio clip, uh, that I shared because it was absolutely fantastic what he was saying. Uh, you know, and you're saying like, why do they keep on inviting these people that run these NGOs who make $350,000 a year to speak, you know, on behalf of the, you know, it's like, Ask us. Mm-hmm. Ask us. Yeah. This, yeah, the CEO of the Daily Bread Food Bank, doing good work, this goes on CTV. But I think the message would have been more compelling coming from someone like Toronto Dan. I think maybe a little bit. Somebody who's been there, lived it, lived yeah. experience. Yeah. 
or our friend Melissa or PNC Bio, or, right? So you have to, uh, the right people are not being invited to the party. Clearly. That's pretty much the, the, the essence of it. So when we're talking about corporate greed, like as I mentioned yesterday, um, the capital gains include, right? It's, it's not being taxed more on the capital gains. It's being taxed on more of them, which is mm -hmm. slightly different, right? So it's uh, like the marginal tax rate, right? Once you earn right. over a certain amount. Right, exactly. So, and your first 250,000 is free and every dollar after 250,000 is, is now 66 cents of it rather than 50 cents of it is taxed. So it's the amount of it that is taxed. That was the only, what they call taxation measure to the negative. When they say to the negative, it's money coming out of your pocket as opposed to taxation measure to the positive, which is money going into your pocket. So that was the only taxation to the negative in the entire budget. And it was for the richest 0.13%. And why are we making so much noise about 0.13% of the population? Oh, man. They have all the money. They have all the money. They control the message. Yes. And as Kit Michael just said here in the chat, and they increased the lifetime limit. So the lifetime limit was $1 million before you could own, once you declared $1 million in capital gains, that was it. Mm. Now you get $1.25 million. So you get to make 250000 more in capital gains free over the course of your lifetime. But you'll be charged $0.66. Cents on 66 cents of them rather than 50 henceforth. Mm -hmm. So they were given something. It's not like the government just took, they were given something. Yeah, but people and, don't understand that because the message that went out there was they're robbing us blind. Well, not only robbing us blind, but they're trying to hurt you by robbing us blind. Yes. Because so could you, now that they're robbing us blind, we're, I guess we're just going to have to go elsewhere. And I guess you guys won't have a job and won't be able to pay. But yeah, it, it's not our fault for being too greedy. It's their fault for making us want to pay, making them want us pay our fair share. If you could explain that to Lachlan, please. I don't so, know if you saw him yesterday. <laughs> uh, I did. Losing it. No, yesterday I lost my mind. Uh, not my mind. Uh, yesterday the whole day got away from me. So for company and so for individuals, Profits in excess of $250,000 a year annually. So people are complaining. They're trying to complain. They're trying to frame this as a bad thing for the people who might make $250,000 in capital years, capital gains once. Like let's say you live in Toronto and you know the prices of real estate are ridiculous in Toronto and you sell your home and boom, make a lot mm. of them, you know, make that. Because, but your primary residence is exempt. Right. So it doesn't count. So if you happen to have enough stocks in your RSP or your pension fund or whatnot, such that they would make $250,000 in passive income every year, income you make for doing nothing, not breaking one ounce of sweat, passive income, money that you have invested is making for you already. If you are fortunate enough to have $250,000 a year, yeah. every single year coming your way like this, you really have nothing to complain about this. And if you're lucky enough to have this big windfall where that happens just once, mm. I don't know, but I don't see, there is absolutely nothing going on. And let's, I live a comfortable life. Mm-hmm. Right? Not luxurious. I have a small little house, fewer than 900 square feet. Right? But you're comfortable. Yard, but I'm comfortable. I'm comfortable. I am not suffering. I have a good life. Right? There is nothing going on in my life anywhere that is going to net me $250,000 in passive income in one year. There's no... There is a, not even a snowball chance in hell that this will happen to me once in my life. About the only way it could potentially happen is if my beaver sweetie's invention really blows up and he becomes super rich and mm -hmm. something happens someday. But otherwise, 
this is never going to, there's just no way. I just do not make that much money to be able to save that much money for one day. To, it's just not going to happen. The only thing that would happen in my life that would have $250,000 come in my bank account in one shot is selling this house. And then I'm going to still have to split it with my beaver sweeties. <laughs> so it doesn't even hit 250, but it's this house. I have a graphic right? for you. That's and it's cool. exempt. Yeah. I don't have to worry. I do not have to lose one nanosecond of sleep over this, mm. but they're trying to make you believe that it's coming for you. Oh, of course they are. Of so, course they are. For I've got a graphics stuff. for you here. You're going to like. Okay. I just, I just want to finish this point here. So for individuals, you get the $250,000 a year annually for companies though. It's baseline, right? It's from dollar zero. And that's why you hear all these people screaming and yelling. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, according to this graph, uh, it turns out uh, higher capital gains taxation is great for investment. Budget 2024 yes. proposed that the tax break on capital gains be smaller. This actually happened before from 1988 to 2000. But instead of investment collapsing as corporate Canada scaremongered, it doubled. What? what? This goes back from 1985, I think. And you can see the graph here. Dates, times. And look, it's just steadily gone up. Now, sure, there's a bit of a dip in 2002, but this is, this is I'm sorry, it's just from 88 to 2000. It, it dipped in 2002, and it peaked in 2001. Mm-hmm. 6.2, 6.1, 2000. And it dipped here when they, didn't when we they have decreased a little, it. Didn't we have a, oh, they decreased it then. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes, it, so it's, Proposed that the tax break on capital gains be smaller. This actually happened before from 88 to 2000. Yeah, got it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But instead yeah. of investment collapsing as corporate Canada scaremongered, it doubled. And mm -hmm. every time somebody says, do you realize what this is going to do? Uh, innovators and, and manufacturers, they're all going to leave the country. And I'm like, no, they're fucking not. No. No, they're not. And if they do, let them go. Because somebody will fill the void because we still need those things. Number one. Number two. Stares at you in Scandinavian. Ooh. Email Tell me Finland is not an innovative nation. Tell me Sweden, Norway are not innovative nations. Norway is the most electrified when it comes to vehicles nation per capita on earth. Yes, I get their prop. That, that, that's, I get the population smaller. That's what I said per capita for. It's like all of the arguments, all of the statements, nothing they say has any empirical evidence to back it up. It's all scare tactics. I don't want to pay more. I don't give a shit. You know why I don't give a shit? Because Scandinavia is proven wrong. And I actually had a conversation with someone yesterday about that. And they said, well, well you're right about Scandinavia. People do pay higher taxes there, but they get more value for their taxes. And I go, and we have to hold our government to account for that. It's our job to do that. Because in Scandinavian countries, Sweden, Finland, Norway, Denmark, Iceland, because it's all Nordic countries, they hold the government to account. If you do not do with the tax money that we give you what we want you to do, i.e. invest in infrastructure, invest in public transit, invest in health care, invest in innovation. If you do not do that and we see waste or corruption, you're gone, pal. Yeah. And uh, to go with that graph that you showed, which you should send me that uh, image because I will definitely be able to use it. Uh, you have Max Fawcett writes, fun fact, under Brian Mulroney's PCs in the 1980s, the capital gains inclusion rate was hiked from 50 to 75%, as you showed us, Mr. Grizzly. And mm -hmm. the overall combined corporate rate was in the low 40s versus the current rate of 26.5. And yet businesses were formed, they took risks, imagine that. And then um, some person, then snart capital is much more mobile nowadays. Free trade was its intimacy and dial-up modems weren't even a thing back then. Uh, this is a quote, R. Mohammed underscore YYC, which is an account that you should uh, block because it's an account that actually is, a, well, basically offers BS. And this particular person seems to have a particular obsession uh, with Max Fawcett. Mm. Max Fawcett seems to find it really amusing that this guy seems to have uh, developed a, a fixation on him. Uh, but uh, then Max refers runs. People are just as mobile as they were back then, and it's people who start businesses and become entrepreneurs. If you think we should participate in a race to the bottom on corporate taxes, just say so. 
Well, speaking oh. of starting businesses, last night on uh, Mademoiselle Fox's Fun and Feminist Conversations uh, podcast, had a, a gentleman on who started a company called Ability Hive, and we're going to try and connect that individual with Super Kyle because Ability Hive is about uh, mobility and accessible devices and access on, uh, f- for individuals who require them. So we're going to try and put him in touch with Super Kyle because Super Kyle, I think, might be able to uh, lend a voice or help. I hey, just put two people together in a room. Let's see what happens, right? Yeah, you, you never see, you never know. Never. Um, so before all of this started, right, when they talked about, because before the budget was announced, it was very clear that they were talking about that there was going to be some type of taxation measure of some kind. And Christian Freeland made it very, very clear you know, that, you know, if you were among the middle class, you were not going to be paying more. Ooh, super kick, super cows in the chat. And he says, hey, hey, sounds good. There you go. And oh, so uh, at nine... And I basically tweeted out at that point. Well, I, I'd been saying it before. What is it? Hugh, stereotypical, fear-congering, boilerplate talking points about jobs disappearing, stifling foreign investment businesses shutting down and moving away and punishing job creators in three, two, mm. and... <laughs> and, you know, and they were out. And yesterday I mentioned the, the people that had uh, abbreviation CFP in their handle, the sort of alleged certified uh, financial planners that all popped up on Twitter overnight, whose accounts I've never seen ever once before. Uh, but then, you know, this was the tweet that got me saying, you know, the other day I said all of that. And then Q Anthony, this is mm-hmm. another one of these accounts that nobody should have any time for because to basically spew. BS all the time, but Anthony underscore K O C H. Coke. We don't know if he's related to the Cokes that we know. Those ones, yeah. Already, if your last name is Coke, like this, and you're talking about the subject, maybe you should take a seat and sit this one out. Mm-hmm. But anyway, it's always, quote, fuck the corporations until the taxes they pay and the jobs they create go away. Never forget that people and corporations who have means, both financial and ability, have options and they can and will leave. And David Mosscrop confirms what I've been saying all the time. Canada is an enviable state compared to other G7 states, and U.S. political instability isn't exactly inviting. Don't be so melodramatic. We'll be fine. So the full court, oh, what someone think of the 0.13% press is definitely out and out there. Um, they are going to be trying to gaslight you for weeks on this one it costs here's the thing is that even though they could probably save money maybe by doing some tax stuff it also costs money to do that it costs money to pay your accountant to find ways to do that because oh, i don't like this i'm going to up and leave it costs money to up and leave it costs money to up and leave so uh, this is not going to happen you may have one or two that go up and say you know what that's it i'm gone because then everybody will like point to that one or two and those they will be the forever examples yeah but that company yeah yeah that those two companies left everyone else stayed thank you for proving our point exhibit a your honor so (laughs) so just right Exactly, Kid Vim. This is passive income that's being taxed again. It's you know, the people says I work hard for my money. No, no, you worked hard for the money that went into the bank account. Yes, the interest that you're getting on the money in the bank account, you did not work hard for. <laughs> Let's divide those two pools of money. All right, you're not being punished because you were successful, just because you have a lot of money in the bank account that happened to make passive income well we a lot of the problems we have today uh, can be traced back to two two individuals who worked hand in hand ronald reagan of course ending marginal tax rates on corporations creating this trickle down effect that was espoused by milton friedman Milton Friedman was also the individual uh, who taught that that uh, shareholders trump everything and everyone, pol- uh, profits before people. Uh, Milton Friedman may have been a very intelligent 
individual and and learned, but his ideas were horrible, and they've done much to destroy the North American economy for the average individual and just make the wealthy super wealthy, insanely wealthy. Again, shareholders trump everyone by evidence of the fact that stock buybacks occur um, at the last minute so that way the CEO and all the executives will get their bonus because their stock price increased because they bought it back, driving the price up. It's, it's a pump and dump. Uh, it's, it's a loan. It's, just, it's, it's bullshit is what it is. There's not a damn thing I can do about it, but I can inform as many people as possible. Let me tell you a little bit about Milton Friedman, right? So for those of you who don't know, are you familiar with Milton Friedman? The name, yes. Yeah. Well, in the 1960s, he became the main advocate opposing Keynesian government policies. Uh, he theorized there existed a natural rate of unemployment and argued that unemployment below this rate would cause inflation to accelerate. <laughs> he uh, was an advisor to Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. He extolled the virtues of a free market econ economic system with minimal government intervention in social matters. <sighs> He believed and advocated for policies such as voluntary military, volunteer military, freely fo floating exchange rates, abolition of medical licenses, a negative income tax, school vouchers. He did oppose the war on drugs and supported drug liberaliz liberalization policies. So that's interesting. Uh, he supported school choice. Uh, it just a lot of his policies that were enacted by Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, for that matter. Are, are what went on to destroy the middle class in, in North America and, well, the UK. It's, it's a whole different kettle of fish. Yeah. Could, and Mr. it Cal all comes goes, back to making rich people richer. Yep. Yeah, get Mr. Kyle has it here. Milton Freeman's ideas require people to be in poverty and do show that is economic gospel. Correct. Yeah. Um, so you have, we're, we're talking about corporate greed. And yesterday we showed you the clip of Jagmeet Singh reacting uh, to the budget. And I noticed you, Mr. Grizzly, during, uh, during it, after he got through the opening where he said forced seven times, that was just mm. completely silly. Yes, yes. Had he eliminated that whole few paragraphs from his thing and started from the point he started talking about corporate greed to the end, mm -hmm. he would have had a great point. Yes. He would have had a great point because that's something on which if he wants to make a lane to differentiate himself from the liberals, there's his lane. The liberals didn't go all the way on taxing the rich. They did not impose a wealth tax. They did not impose a tax on higher or excess corporate profits. That's NDP territory, traditional mm -hmm. NDP territory, right there. Had he started with that and ran with just that, that would have been fine. But the whole thing is, like, yeah, we, the fourth, par fourth party, forced them to do all of these things. Kicking and screaming, they didn't want to do it. They did not want to do it, but we made them. I guess, and the, since the confidence and supply agreement has been signed, you never heard one liberal anywhere on a microphone or on a camera complaining about the things that they agreed to do in the deal and say, well, you know what? This is a little hard and we don't want to do it. Not once. There's absolutely no narrative whatsoever coming from anybody in the Liberal Party that said that they resisted, didn't want to do it, didn't want to, ever. Nothing in the public sphere. But Jagmeet Singh wants to convince you that it is. That whole part, he completely dumbed, <laughs> he kicked himself in the teeth. He did. With, with, is, that, with that opening. That's, that's pretty flexible. Because the lane, yeah. But the lane was right open. Had he just stuck to that, right, he would have done very, very, very well. Now, here's the thing. Um, you know how I mentioned strategically that Pierre Poyev doesn't have, uh, well, has about 18 months to go and uh, you know his current act won't be the same. And of course, the liberals couldn't do the same as just like laying down and like, getting punched in the teeth all the time, kicked in the nuts like Pierre has been doing for the last year. So we had, we had talked on the show, we had noticed you know, that Pierre, that uh, the prime minister, you know, uh, when Bell Globe Media fired some people and he was in front of the mic and said he was pissed. It's like, ooh, we have uh, some spicy Justin mm -hmm. coming up. And a couple of other times he came out, and, you know, 
did some things. And then he went on Ryan Jefferson, Jesperson, and gave him extra time and had that interview where he was responding in full answers. Yes. All complete sentences. And then he had his testimony at the foreign interference inquiry. And he did literally just as well as he did as at the Public Order Emergency Commission, so much so that you have people saying, like, why can't he be this Justin all the time? I guess in every forum, I have a theory on that is that, you know, different types of engagement with the media require different types of things and people get their media training to behave in different ways. And so they probably do that. But yes, he did do that thing. And the, you know, I kept on saying, you know, is there something coming? Is there something coming? Well, this may be it because kids and cubs strategic wise, strategy wise, if you're watching this, this budget and particularly this one measure has completely flipped the narrative. The media is full of the, oh my God, what about the billionaires? Instead of, hey, here's what PP said today. He's gotten very, very, very little attention on this budget. It's surprising how little attention Pierre Polyev has gotten in his reaction to this budget has gotten. It's, and in one fell swoop, just like that, the narrative becomes how much are we taxing the rich, which is a narrative and an agenda that the prime minister sets. And all of a sudden, Pierre Podiev is on the side of having to try to defend not taxing the 0.13%. So all of a sudden, Pierre is defending 0.13% while the prime minister is defending 99.87%. That's a pretty damn smooth move. Mm -hmm. That's a damn smooth move. It, and it's like just literally what? So here, Prime Minister, it's, it's like Pierre Polyev came with, a, with his fist like this and a running punch and go, I'm going to get you. And the Prime Minister just like, just a ding. <laughs> just like, yeah. oh, look at that. So, um, and you can see that in a, uh, the prime minister the next day, and this is as reported in that liberal rag, the National Post. Trudeau attacks Polyev in campaign style budget rally. Polyev described the budget as wasteful, saying the debt was taking funds away from real priorities. And you have the prime minister basically making the point. For the first time in a generation, we are spending on more. So, sorry, this is Pierre Polyev going. For the first time in a generation, we are spending more on debt interest than on health care. This budget lays out a plan to make... Anyway. Blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. Right? His usual stuff. And then, Prime Minister is... This budget lays out a plan to make sure Canadians can build homes, build companies, build solutions, and make the best country in the world even better. So that's the start. We're asking them to pay their fair share so that younger generations can have the same opportunities that Gen Xers, Boomers, and other generations had when they were starting their lives. They're voting against fairness. They will be voting against asking the ultra-rich to pay their share. They are voting against fairness. <sighs> Pierre Polyev is in a bit of a difficult situation at this moment because all the media wants to talk about it's all by God, poor the rich. Mm -hmm. And it's not like Pierre Polyev can actually go out to a mic and say, yay, the rich. Well. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming that all those people that came for the convoy in Ottawa are not out there going, yay, <laughs> they're rich. Yeah. Right? I mean, he needs the votes of these people, and he's presenting himself as the common man. He's never worked a real job you, in his life. Well, exactly. Who will defend the blue-collar worker. Let me rephrase that. Let me rephrase what I just said. It is a real job that he has. Okay. And yes, he does put the hours in. I've said that time and time again. He does. But he doesn't know what it's like to struggle. He doesn't know what it's like to put a 14-hour workday in on your feet on a construction site. 
or in a retail environment, or as a server, or as a nurse, or a doctor, or a police officer, or a firefighter, or a soldier. He doesn't know what it's like to be on your feet for hours a day correcting papers and, and dealing with students. He doesn't know what it's like to live in a world outside of the one he's resided in for 20 years. He works. He puts his hours in. He has a very nice payday and a golden parachute of a indexed, fully indexed pension. And every possible health care benefit you can imagine that he wants to deny you. Yeah. Now, and here's why I mentioned Pierre Polyev in this instance. You know, I hope you'll show this video. I'm not going to show him here and make you force you to listen to him talk. But here he is on the floor. Mm hmm. Right. Bring home paychecks for our people when I'm PM. But here I mean, they don't they don't bring look, home paychecks right now. Look at to who he's talking. Yeah. Right. He's on a shop floor. Right. People, people are wearing. Are, it's really hard to see. Just 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 hit the in the corner of the video. There's the no no not that just yeah hit uh, the. I, hit. Yeah, I I know that, but I need something oh. there. That's why. Oh, I'm sorry. That way. Okay. I don't know. Um, um, so. And anyway, okay, I'll try again. So see who he's he's talking to, mm -hmm. right? Everybody, blue collar workers on a shop floor. More boots, less suits. Trade workers who build our country will bring home paychecks for people when I'm our people when I'm PM. As he's wearing a suit, yeah, and no boots. Uh, Above uh, here, just... <laughs> again, right? Can you tell yeah. I'm cosplaying? Look at the way I'm wearing my vest. It's all detached. This Patrick Gagnon says, FYI, as a tradesperson, I'll let you in on a trade secret. We know politicians like Pierre couldn't identify a hammer in a lineup of hammers. Do you think it's a coincidence that the hard hat strap is set too small and the vest is put on like a buffoon? Spoiler, it's not a coincidence. No. This. And again, said, so, you know, the other day when he showed up on the shop floor denouncing people who wear suits while wearing a suit. The guy's a poser. I guess, as Kit Vim says, he cheated to get the job, and we know that's true because he has a lifetime deferred prosecution agreement with Elections Canada because he was caught on camera cheating. And then we have um, this guy here, W. Brett Wilson, mm -hmm. I guess, who actually posted a cartoon of an emaciated cow with a mm -hmm. cowbell around its neck, like this, and the Canada flag on it looking at Justin Trudeau with trepidation as he's coming with milk buckets and going tax time. So apparently like this in this cartoon, Wilson is the emaciated cow. The rich people have been taxed so much that they're barely getting by. They're literally just skin and bones. Uh -huh. And Justin Trudeau is coming for the rest. So Wilson wants you to believe that he's the cow. In this scenario, but really, he's the guy in the suit with the cookies. Yep. You're going to have to read it. Uh, describe it. I'll describe it. So there's, there's three people sitting at a table. On one side, there is a uh, black gentleman. In the middle, there's a wealthy older gentleman with a pile of cookies on a plate. And to the opposite side of him, to his left, our right, there's a uh, construction worker in a safety vest and hard hat with a plate with one cookie on it. And the older suited gentleman, bespeckled individual with the pile of cookies on his plate, pointing at the black gentleman to his right, my left, careful mate, that foreigner wants your cookie. This is about pitting um, the poor against the middle class. The middle class. That's what's going on here. That's what's going on here. They want us to fight each other. Yes, because then they can control us and the narrative at the same time. They want Keep us, us fight fighting, and we, we, if we're too busy fighting amongst ourselves, we won't notice that we're getting robbed blind. Yeah. yeah. Now, on the strategy side, Evan Scrimshaw had something out, uh, I think, is it yesterday? Yep, yesterday. Uh, that I was really surprised because, um, well, I mean, he's been uh, taking some swings mm -hmm. at the liberals. I mean, he's been saying for months, it's like, if you want something, get the F off your butts and get, like, make something happen here. Mm -hmm. Well, 
Other than a gaffe, what was Justin Trudeau's, quote, housing is not a primary federal responsibility, quote, a sign of? It was a gaffe, but more importantly, it was a sign of anger. It was a sign of frustration as the government was unable to get a grip on the housing issue. Whatever the truth of the argument, it was an argument that nobody wanted to hear and nobody listened to as anything other than out-of-touch whining. Housing isn't, or at least shouldn't be, a primary federal responsibility. Again, let me replace, repeat that. Housing isn't, or at least shouldn't be, a primary federal responsibility. And it isn't. But people didn't want to hear that. Although given that a sizable amount of the damage to our housing market was out of control, increases to immigration levels without ensuring infrastructure was able to handle it, it was is more of a federal responsibility than many want to admit. The budget has created a similar group of people acting like Trudeau did on housing, and that's the group of people complaining bitterly about how fair it is that they have it is, sorry, complaining bitterly about how unfair it is that they have to pay some extra taxes. The capital gains increase is debatable policy, though I must confess I found myself nodding along to Trevor Toombs' analysis. But the politics for this opposition oppos- sorry, but the politics for this opposition are laughably dumb, and I don't get why the right wing media apparatus are willingly engaging in this nonsense. Poilievre is smartly staying very far away from anything that could even be remotely described as a quote against this capital gains tax rise. He's actually claiming it will raise taxes on the middle class, but he's actually avoided actually saying he'd repeal it. Mm-hmm. The hope implicit is that a lot of coverage, sorry, the hope implicit in a lot of the coverage is that Poilievre will get the credit for voting against the broader budget amongst those op- opposed to this change and get to say he hasn't made any decisions on reversing it, the hike amongst those who like it. So, he is trying to let the people on the shop floor believe that he does not support this because he's going to vote the entire budget. But all the people that would benefit from this, he's not telling him. He would, he's not saying he would keep it in place either. Mm. Well, let me put it this way. He might be telling them privately that he would repeal it, but he's not saying it out loud. Yeah. And Pierre can't say it out loud. Of course not. So the more this story keeps on surviving in the media, so it's a two-week, three-week story rather than just a one-day or two-day story. It's, oh my God, look what they're doing. They're driving all this. He's going to be asked this question. There's only going to be so many times he can give an evasive answer as we've seen before. Mm -hmm. And usually when he gets, when usually when he figures out that his evasive answers aren't going to cut it anymore, he usually lashes out at the journalist. So uh, be prepared to see another PP meltdown because if somebody really wants to get him on the on the record, yes or no, yes or no, how much, yes or no, will you keep this capital gains increased inclusion if you become prime minister? Yes or no. And if not, how much, how much, just a number, please, how much? Yeah. Uh, these are questions he doesn't want to answer. Of course not. These are questions he should be asked. So he's not doing very well. He's not in a good situation. All of a sudden, well, here's the thing. All of a sudden, he's not setting the narrative and he's not controlling the agenda. This is not a comfortable position for him because he's a bully. He wants to be the first to accuse you of doing something so that you're on the defensive and you're on the back foot explaining how it is you didn't do it. He's the guy that wants you to prove a negative. Mm-hmm. He's the guy that shows up to you, shows up and says, you know, when you start a conversation that opens with, when did you stop beating your wife? Why uh, uh, don't beat my wife? And then boom, he sees yeah. control. Yeah. That's how he does it. He's good that's his it. trick. That's, that's his entire act. That's all he's got. That's all he's got. Because... But it's abuser talk and it's abuser behavior. Being the first to seek to put the other one on the back foot, on the defensive by accusing them of something you know they did not do or could not know, they didn't, they did. That's abuser behavior. Oh, yeah. That's abuser behavior. It's dominance, toxic dominance. By the way, the broader media apparatus is kicking into action has to be a concern for the conservatives because this is a way that the traditional Tory coalition and the places Poliev wants to win are going to disagree. And hell, indirectly, this could be a savior to Jagmeet's NDP too. The problem for modern conservatism as an ideology is simple. Fiscal conservatism as an ideology is dead. Mm-hmm. Boris, Sunak, Scott Moe all did some fiscally conservative things, namely lots of tax cuts. 
but none of them have actually been fiscal conservatives. All of them have been willing to throw economic orthodoxy out the window on some combination of trade, immigration, subsidy, or just reticence to actually cut spending in good economic times. Polyev isn't actually much better because he's so far refused to actually cut any of the things the liberals have actually done. Listen to him on Radio Canada this week, and the actual complaints he has about the government's spending could be coming from a dipper. The dental program hasn't actually cleaned any teeth yet, is an argument of the, against the dental benefit. Yeah, because mm-hmm. it was just launched, you dumb bat. It's not because the problem well, no, is it has effective. to be 100% operational from day one. Yes. Look, it's, it's, people are registering now, and sometime in May, a set of teeth will be cleaned for the first time under the program. As you've known about since it was announced. Yeah, but let's let's make hay that it's not operational right away, even though I know it wasn't supposed to be operational till May. Yeah, exactly. But apparently that's an argument against it. Like this. Just like the carbon tax hasn't solved hasn't ha, the carbon tax hasn't stopped didn't stop that fire from happening, so therefore it doesn't work. It's useless. Right? Can I but, but can it was the same thing. People? It was the same thing like this, or you know, the vaccines didn't stop the vaccines didn't stop COVID from being spread. They're, they weren't a guarantee. They would not get sick. They would just really, really reduce your chances of getting sick. And if you did get sick, reduce your chances of being really sick or dying. Right. Doesn't prevent. But, but the vaccine didn't prevent all cases of COVID from being transmitted ever again. So the vaccine didn't work. Well, think of it this way. This is their, this is their attitude. Think of it this way. Let's go Star trek if you will, for a moment. For just a split second. Shields up. Our shields are at 30%. Shields are down. It's a shield. It doesn't last forever. It's not impermeable. It will break yep. down. Yep. He, he uh, we wants, know these things. <laughs> yep. He wants to walk a tightrope because he knows fiscal conservatism doesn't pull well. Polyev has always struck me as a student of both political history and international politics, and he can see that Sunak and Dutton aren't making any headway calling for tax cuts and spending decreases. I suspect he knows as well as me that the legion of U.S. polls always shows, which is that spending cuts are popular in the abstract by cutting basically every name spending area polls underwater. Everyone thinks there's tens of billions we can cut from foreign aid and generalized nonsense, but the truth is that governments have mostly excised that specific brand of waste. If Polyev wants to, quote, fix the budget, his latest verb, the noun, air quotes, strategy to solve many crises we face, he will actually have to do quite a lot of things that his lack of political courage do not enable him to do. We have seen this cowardice in recent weeks as he categorically refused to call out Doug Ford and Daniel Smith for their utter depravity on the housing front. Doug Ford unilaterally deciding for some reason fourplexes are like the absolute worst thing in human history and we should never do them under any circumstance whatsoever. And Daniel Smith having passed or not in my backyard legislation. This is so absurd. I'll be damned if the federal government deals directly with municipalities and school boards and other organizations. They got a deal completely through me. Stop doing my damn job. Well, Maybe you did, if you did your job. <laughs> I almost said the B word there. Well, Gurleen, you have not been doing your damn, like, if the prime minister does not do your damn job, who will? Because it sure ain't going to be you, sister. <laughs> You've made it very clear that you have no intention of doing your damn job. It's, I'm going to fight those fat cats in Ottawa. Uh, oh, you mean the ones who built the, the pipeline? The ones who gave you more aid during COVID? You got more per capita than any other province? The one who continues to give you... Is, those are the fat cats you're going to fight? The ones who are actually doing shit for you? Building houses in your municipality because you won't get off your lazy duff and do it yourself? Those are the fat cats you're going to fight in Ottawa? Okay, no problem. No problem. Go ahead. Feel free. Knock yourself the hell out. (sighs) I'm exasperated every damn day. I know, I know. So she's literally threatened to take legal action against the federal government to prevent it from acting on the national housing strategy. She complains Alberta is not getting its fair share of per capita funding on housing, doesn't like that some housing infrastructure money is coming with strings attached, such as having to build a climate-friendly house, for example, mm. or new zoning rules. Don't tell us what to do. You're not the boss of me. Uh, she says, Alberta, and, and, and if you want to cut our federal funding because we won't play by the rules, well, I won't stand for that either. Well, girl, <laughs> I'm sorry, ma'am, but this ain't a Burger King. I mean, 
this woman is out there telling the prime minister who we should have in this cabinet or not. And if the prime minister said that to her, uh, yeah, you should probably get that. She would have a freaking meltdown. Oh, yeah. Faster than you could say frosty. Mm-hmm. But she's telling the prime minister who he can have in his cabinet and who he should fire. She's telling the cabinet about prime minister what he and he cannot do with federal money. But she says, hey, don't come and say that to me. Old Dan Yeller, quote, we'll either see them at the bargaining table or we'll see them in court, but we will not stand by while they continue to treat Alberta municipalities unfairly. She's trying, she's trying to create the situation that the prime minister is treating Alberta municipalities unfairly by wanting to fund them directly because she claims, she claims they're not getting their fair share. Well, Sean Fraser had a couple of things to say about that. Not only has he said that Alberta has gotten its fair share, he also said nobody wants to hear politicians fighting over jurisdiction. They just want to see homes built and that Alberta must come to the table with funding too. Sean mm-hmm. Fraser, quote, if Alberta wants to add a layer of bureaucracy to approve funding decisions by the federal government, they're within their rights to do so. Never ever thought it's here in the days he had said conservative party talking for more bureaucracy. More government bureaucracy. Isn't the, the whole conservatives like government must get out of the way? Well, she actually wants to insert herself right in the way. She's not a real conservative. She's not a real conservative. So if Alberta wants to add a layer of bureaucracy to approve funding decisions by the federal government, they're within their rights to do so. It will slow things down. Mm-hmm. If we can work together, we can have Alberta step up to the table with investments and policy changes that will make it easier to build homes. And she always compares herself to Quebec. Well, let me remind you, kids and cubs, that the prime premier of Quebec, Francois Legault, in December, December, <laughs> was rushing up to the mic just before he had a scheduled meeting with the prime minister where they were going to discuss this, mm-hmm. saying, that $900 million that the federal government says they have for housing, they need, they need to make, come through with that and they need to give it to us now because we have $900, 900 million as well and we're willing to do that and we need to know that we have that commitment so I could put it in my budget. You don't hear Danielle Smith saying that though, do you? No, no, you do not. She's not saying, like Quebec, we want to be treated like Quebec. Well, if you want to be treated like Quebec, maybe you should act like Quebec. Yeah. Show up at the table with matching money and commit to put it in your budget and commit to spend all of it on housing. But she don't want to do that. Don't expect to be treated like Quebec if you're not prepared to act like Quebec. Just saying. She wants all the toys. But won't put any of the um, effort into uh, earning them. All the bonus, none of the responsibility. She wants all the prizes, but doesn't want to do any of the work. Well, I mean, she's tied in with Parker, who's a Wexit idiot. Yeah. But I'm saying that the prime minister should call her bluff here on this one. Because Mm -hmm. like I mentioned, it's like, go ahead, take him to court. See See if that's a good look for you. Well, not even see what happens. See if that's a good look for you. Because court cases take time. And that means every single day that you're in court with that, somebody's going to be asking you why it is that you're blocking housing and what the big deal. People are going to start looking. People are going to start writing exposés on that. People are going to be noticing that you're actually full of crap. They're going to be asking you questions. And then you're going to be sitting there in media opportunities with your purse slips and going, duck. That thing that you do as your fingers do this. When you're mad that someone's nailed you to the wall. Go ahead, Danny. Go and bring the federal government to court. Wear that look and put yourself in a position in your own province of being you against all the mayors because there's only one of you and there are many mayors. Go for it. Make the prime minister's day. Go ahead. Make my day. Take him to court. See where that nets you. Tell everybody in Alberta that you are not willing to build houses. You'd rather fight the government in court rather than doing the minimum, wanting to change zoning law to build housing. Go ahead. I dare you. It's bluster. It's bluff. Somebody needs to call them on it. Try to explain to the government, to the people of Alberta, that you would rather spend hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees fighting this than actually just build the damn house. Except the zoning and the green building code things. Mm-hmm. 
it's not going to be a good look for you. Call the bluff. Call the bluff. That's what I said. Um, breaking um, news. Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> You're making it very hard for me to get through a thought <laughs> today. Go ahead. <laughs> breaking news. Go ahead. No, no, it's fine. Go ahead. All right. Um, so back to, uh, sorry, I lost uh, my screen there. That happens. Uh, to to Evan's uh, article here. So you have all this stuff going on. Um, the capital gains r- tax rise, though, it's Thank not bad at all for the left. They are finally doing what I have been begging them to do in these pages for nearly a year, which is to take back control of the agenda with things that will make the lives of the political staff of the opposition difficult. For months, this government has been going where the opposition wanted them and fighting on the opposition's preferred terrain. Now, the political debate is on a tax rise on wealthy Canadians and corporations. It's a political win that's at least defensible economics. It's a godsend to progressives because the conservatives don't know what to say. Now, Bill Morneau a former liberal finance minister came out to the press and said that this was a terrible thing. And he had Andrew Scheer going around and uh, saying, see, even uh, former liberal ministers, even former liberal ministers disagree with this. I believe that his uh, actual quote was Trudeau's latest budget is so bad. How bad is it? Even former liberal finance ministers are speaking out. This budget raised taxes, keeps interest rates high and will drive investments to other countries. You pay for Trudeau's massive debt and tax hikes with a image of a CBC article that says Bill Morneau slams Freeland's budget as a threat to investment economic growth. Former finance minister says the rich corporations will think twice about investing in Canada. Well, we've already shown that that's not true. Right, with the Scandinavia thing, and we already showed it was not true even for Canada during the 80s. Mr. Grizzly showed us that. So Andrew Shear is going that. And I'm sitting there like this. Yeah. And by former liberal finance ministers, S plural, he means one, just one, Bill Morneau, the guy that Andrew Shear himself helped run out of town as he was destroying the We Charity for no damn reason. A man who personally likely is of the 0.13% and whose business, I assume, is among the 300,000 largest. So you got Bill Morneau, a guy who's probably getting double dinged. Right? He's one of the richest men in Canada. I'm sure he reports about $1.4 million in income a year. And then the business, Morneau Chappelle, I'm pretty sure is one of the 300,000 largest Corporations. So he personally and his corporation are being dinged. He gets dinged personally after the first 250,000 and the corporation gets dinged on big on baseline. Well, gee, let's run to the most objective source. Let's run to the source that has no personal, no personal investment at all in this decision. And let's get a quote from him. Now, if you may have respected Bill Morneau as a finance minister and what he did, that was one thing. But is Bill Morneau really the person you're going to go to for an objective, not self-interested take on an increased capital gains inclusion? Given he is personally very, very rich and given his company is one of the 300,000 largest companies and trusts in the nation. Andrew Scheer always goes for the person with the most objective take, doesn't he? Corporate greed, my friends. Corporate greed. So, Evan Clear ends with, The Liberals have finally started a week with a clear ambition and seemingly have managed to get to the end of it on message, but how much of the furniture will it save? I won't pretend to know but the government is showing much needed signs of successfully getting from an idea to completion. And after years of screaming about their inability to shoot straight, this is a win. And Polyev's inability to say he'd reverse it 
shows it. Boom. Prime Minister is putting both Pierre Polyev and Daniel Smith in some very interesting positions. They're going to have to contort themselves a lot. And over the next weeks, it's going to be when they're, when they're talking and screaming and yelling and whining and complaining, pay attention to what it is they are working very hard to not say as opposed to what it is that they actually are saying because that's where the message will be. That is where the message is going to be. Daniel Smith, are, so are you following through? When will you be filing those court papers? Oh, well, you know, we have to wait to see. The rules. <laughs> Pierre Poyet, will you repeal the enhanced inclusion? Oh, well, you know. Well, 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 well. <laughs> Pay attention to what it is that they are working very hard to not answer. There's going to be a lot going on there. All right, Mr. Grizzly. You said you had the, we had some breaking news. Yes, we do. That may be a little up. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll adjust it later. <laughs> Sorry if you're listening. Uh, Dépêché, uh, la berry, la berry. This is uh, in Iran, uh, Paris. Iran, uh, rue Fresnel à Paris. Il serait porteur uh, d'une grenade ou d'un gilet explosif. Évidemment, uh, vous en doutez, il y a une demande d'intervention qui a été faite. Il y a un périmètre de sécurité uh, que vous, qui a été mis en place. Vous le voyez uh, sur les images. Le préfet de police qui a tout de suite uh, dépêché uh, la BRI, la brigade de recherche et d'intervention. Uh, brigade de recherche et d'intervention qui est un, un groupe d'intervention spécialiste de ce genre de cas comme peut être uh, cette attaque, possible attaque en encore une fois, il faut confirmer que cet homme existe et qu'il permet au consulat d'Iran dans le 16e arrondissement de Paris. D'Iran, rue Fresnel à Paris, il serait porté. All right, so from what I can tell from those clips is that there was uh, something going on uh, at the embassy of Iran in uh, Paris and that there are uh, police officers there. It seems that uh, uh, there's a 30-year-old Frenchman who may have attacked uh, two young girls. Um, and there's a, an operation going on there. Yeah, he's threatening to blow himself up, apparently. This this was like literally just a few moments ago. Uh, so so it, was, it was actually breaking news. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So uh, this is, uh, yeah, uh, again, uh, a lot uh, going on with the whole uh, Israel, Gaza, and uh, Iran uh, inserting itself in it and uh, people uh, trying to uh, make sure it doesn't become a wider regional war. Mm -hmm. um, so... Let's hope that that, uh, that, yeah, that we don't get a wider regional war. It's probably the absolute last thing we need at this moment. Um, According to this, Quebec intent, uh, just this from CTV, Quebec intends to follow Ottawa's lead and increase its capital gains tax rate. Well, there's a plot twist. Yeah. Didn't see that one coming, did you? Hey, Danielle. Yeah. Like I said, if you want to be like treated like Quebec, maybe you should start acting like Quebec. Uh, <laughs> when will you be raising your capital gains uh, tax in the province? Old mm -hmm. Daniel. I just put a link in the chat. It's a CTV Montreal uh, article. Uh, two other things. Wow. Wanted to, yeah. That two other things I wanted to, to bring to you, your attention here. Uh, okay. uh, Super Kyle sent me this. Uh, confirmed the federal government has hit the pause button on public transit funding until after the next election in the middle of a climate crisis. That's not good. Nope. You know, environmental defense. Will the 2024 federal budget leave public transit behind? And yeah, according to Nate Wallace uh, at Climate Nate, uh, the federal government has hit the pause button on public transit funding. Hmm. Well, that's not good. And the other so, thing... So, I mean, is it pause, pause at current levels or... I don't know. Okay. 
I'd have to, I'll have to do some digging. Another one, this was sent to me from Tavi G, uh, media advisory alert for Canadian media, April 23rd, 2024, the Queens Park Media Suite, Legislative Assembly of Ontario from 9 to 9.30 a.m. CLO, I don't know who that is, and partners address chronic underfunding in development, uh, developmental sector, services sector. Uh, Community Living Ontario is what CLO is. Okay, okay. there we go. Yeah, yeah. so there's uh, two, two headlines I thought I'd bring to your attention. All right. Thank you so much. You're now, um, the other thing that we're uh, talking about, and we mentioned it a little bit, was uh, Jagmeet Singh. Mm. Because it's right now with the budget, um, the big, the Greens have come out and said they're not going to vote for it. The Black Québécois has come out and said they're not going to vote for it. And when the Black Québécois, François Blachev, the Black Québécois, was asked, you know, says, well, you know, aren't you... Aren't you going to be like sinking the government? It says, no, 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 no. Me, if I vote against, if I vote against it, I'm not sinking the budget. It's like that will be the that will be the NDP who will have to sink the government. So by coming out first, saying he was not going to do it. Now the reason if François Blanchet doesn't want to support it is because all the programs that are going to require some provincial and federal negotiation. He says, well, you know, since the federal government is just uh, stepping in a provincial area of competence again, again, and again, so I can't support this. Uh, Elizabeth May. Clearly, probably the budget doesn't do enough for the environment, so she can't support it. Um, so that leaves uh, the NDP in the situation. So basically, the opposition parties that put the NDP in the position, uh, well, whether the government lives or fails is uh, lives or falls is uh, all, all dependent on you. Now, Jagmeet Singh is, again, once again, doing a really, really stupid thing. Which is trying to create some suspense as to whether or not he will support it or not. He won't say whether he will support it or not. Which is really, really dumb. So this is another attempt to make himself try to be relevant. I'll play coy as whether or not I'm going to support it or not. Mm -hmm. That way media will come and come and see me every day and ask me the question. So now have you decided you will support? Oh, I don't know. <sighs> There's no mystery. We know he's going to support this. And how do we know this is going to support this? I will tell you. Jagmeet Singh, even though he became liberal, the leader of the federal NDP in 2017, did not assume office as a member of parliament until February 25th, 2019. You will remember back in the day when he became leader, he decided not to run for a seat right, right away, mm -hmm. try apparently build the party. And even though he's from Ontario, ended up running for in Burnaby, British Columbia. He became leader on February 25th. 2019. An MP has to sit six years in the House of Commons to collect their MP pension. Six years from February 25th, 2019 is February 25th, 2025. Yeah, so he ain't there yet. There is no way in hell that Jagmeet Singh is going to do anything to make the government fall before February 25th, 2019. He may still go early, mm -hmm. but he's not going to do it before February 25th, 2019 at all and if on february 25th 20 or february 26th 2019 the day after he qualifies he's still under 20 percent in the polls his party's still under 20 percent. he isn't going no he isn't going unless unless he's the type of person eight nine ten i'm out of here one day, let's call the election. I'm done. I know I'm going to lose my seat, and I know I'm, uh, or I'll keep my seat. But you know, my party will go down polls, and my party will then fire me. Like I'm good with that. I got my pension. See, I don't want to be a, unless he's that type of person. He's not going. No. That date, and odds are that the election will be on the scheduled date. Oh, yeah. Because if he keeps on screwing up like this, there's no way he's going to be over 20% <laughs> by February next year. He's not even there now. All right. Um, the other thing, and this is the, uh, the thing I was mentioning yesterday about uh, Jagmeet Singh, uh, Mr. Grizzly. Uh, the situation that's uh, very strange from the two newspaper articles that uh, came up within days of each other. Mm -hmm. There we go. So April 10th, 2024, 
the first flip-flop. Pressure mounts on Justin Trudeau's liberals as NDP joins conservatives in calling for a national meeting on the carbon levy. April 10th, eh, sorry, April 12th, two days later, unflip flop. After Jagmeet Singh raises doubts, NDP says it still supports a consumer carbon levy. So did they go to the polls and go, oh, that, that didn't land well. We should, uh, we should backtrack. That, that's what we call in politics a trial balloon. Mm-hmm. The first one, it's like, hmm, let's see if I can make some contrast and some decision with the liberals by trying to believe, uh, make Canadians believe that I still support climate action, but maybe not the carbon tax. Or let's just try to stick it to Justin Trudeau by saying I don't support it to put him in a situation where he has to defend a policy I know is unpopular. That might work for me. Mm. That might also be the strategy there. But in the process, you've just sent the signal to every NDP supporter who not only wants a carbon tax, but wants it to be way higher than it is so it can start being more effective more quickly. Those NDP voters that are going, LFG, <laughs> let's go. Cut those subsidies. That's another thing that Prime Minister didn't do is cut the subsidies to oil and gas. Right. When Jagmeet Singh, Jagmeet Singh has this whole wide lane on corporate greed. But he can't let go of the 18-year-old girl who did not get called to prom. <laughs> I sat there waiting by the phone. He said he would call to invite me, but he never called. And here I was. He always says he's going to take me to prom, but he never does. He always says he's going to do child care, but he never does. We have child care. He always says he's going to do private care, but he never does. Uh, we got the in diabetes, insulin, and devices, and contraceptives. He always says he's going to do something. You know, TMX was built. Mm -hmm. Maybe the shtick of a, he always says he's going to do it, but never delivers is not working for you, dude. The force thing doesn't work for you either. But corporate greed, that's your thing, buddy. Yeah. Run with that one. So it, today's politicians try to find some distinctions from contrast on every subject with someone rather than being strategic and saying, you know what, this one, I'm going to agree because the amount of light daylight that I can put between me and the other person is so infinitely, infinitely small are ultimately insignificant, that it's not worth the risk as being seen by some of my base as someone who might be vacillating on support for fighting GHG emissions or fighting for the climate. But right now, I think it's almost like he's in panic mode and he's looking like for every single possible instance, and some of them are not serving him well. Clearly. Some of them are not serving them well. You can't, the carbon tax is one of these things. You're either in or you're out. Mm -hmm. You got to commit. And this little move that he did right there. And it's not like people who believe in supporting the environment are people that are not inclined to vote NDP. So why it is that he wanted to try to torch his base like this by trying to pretend that maybe there was some type of other way when everybody who's serious about this conversation knows that if you look at climate as a, like, you know, fighting climate as a three legged stool, one of the legs of the stool absolutely has to be a price on carbon yeah, of some kind. Uh, definitely. And it is the cheapest and the most efficient and the one that allows you as the consumer, the greatest flexibility on how much you actually pay. Again, the question wasn't, what were you thinking? The question is, were you thinking? Mr. Singh, uh, Mr. Grizzly has said it many times now. Whoever's in your comms department advising you, you are paying them too damn much. They're really bad at their job. Really bad at their job. And I'm not the one to do a better one, okay? So I'm, not, I'm not rallying to take the job. I'm not going to say I can do a better job. I can't. It's not my area of expertise, but who you've got doing it, 
they really need a remedial course because they're really bad at it. It's not it. I can tell this was my job. Yeah. That's not it. <laughs> That's not it. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Now, since we're talking about climate, mm-hmm. I promised the kids and cubs when we would put in our heat pump that I would be giving you some heat pump reports. Right. So, um, we, you know, we have some breaking news, but we, we, we need a, a sort of like the, the just this, this just in. Da, 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 this just in. Breaking oh, news. I got one. I, got one. <laughs> oh, I, I literally do. I have one. Oh, you do? This just in. The eager beaver lot. <laughs> Heat pump report. Since conservative MPs seem to have taken a liking to sharing bills from alleged constituents. Actually, let me rephrase that. Alleged bills from alleged constituents showing that the carbon regulation fee is just so high, so much so high, that's even higher than the actual gas. Mm-hmm. And then they're sitting there asking the whole world to help them make it make sense. To which I say, um, dude, ma'am, you're the legislator. If you can't explain the law, maybe you're not in the right job. Well, you know. (laughs) I don't expect, as a taxpayer, I don't expect my elected representatives to be on Twitter asking me to make the law make sense for them. You're the one who's supposed to understand the law and make it make sense for me. (laughs) That's the way this game works. If you want me to do your job for you, then pay me. Mm -hmm. Move over. I'll take over. I'll take over your seat. Pay me. It's not up to the Canadian public to make it make sense to you, legislatures. Legislators. It's for you to sit in a room with some technical bureaucrat that could explain it to you like you are a five-year-old. And then you go back and you explain it to us like that guy explained it to you. You don't add things. You don't take out things. You don't twist things. You don't torque things. You don't lie. You explain the policy as it works. Well, they can't do that because the policy is good, so (laughs) they have to lie. Well, since we're sharing bills, I figured I would share mine. And I, well, I was going to say I didn't doctor mine. Uh, Yours is authentic. Oh, mine's authentic. Yes. Uh, on the, I, I, at one point, there's a little white spot on it because, well, you know, my address was on the bill. So clearly yeah, yeah, yeah. remove that. Of course. But, oops. That's weird. I don't know what Definitely, happened. Yeah, that's, sorry. That's, what the hell? I don't know, dude. <laughs> there we go. It was the wrong one for some reason. There we go. There's mine. So, see, right here is where I doctored my bill to remove my address. Now, yeah. you'll notice that all those bills that they keep on showing doesn't even say gas uses for what mm-hmm. residents, right? They just have the amounts. Now, look, this is for 32 days. This is my bill for April 5th. I paid 89 cents uh, in gas. I paid 63 cents. The sky is falling. On my federal carbon charge. The delivery charge was 57 cents. Transportation and storage, 4 cents. Monthly service charge, $27.08. No, the sky is falling, dude. Just to remain connected to gas, even though I only used five cubic meters of it in 32 days. For a total of 89 cents, I'm still being dinged $27.08 to remain connected. First, uh, something. I'm mad about that. Yeah. Since everybody's being mad, I guess I'm no. not mad about the carbon fee. I'm being mad that it's personally cost me $27 a month just to remain connected to something that I'm using very little of. Almost not, not at all, right? Yes, Kit Cassie. So that's what a doc- doc- doctored utility bill looks like indeed. This, but, uh, and 
I, I, I forwarded it to Rachel Thomas and the Conservative Party of Canada so that, you know, they could share my bill too and ask people to make it make sense to them. Mm-hmm. So, and what, any response? Uh, no, not yet. So but it's like, there won't be one forthcoming. Yes. There won't be. Yeah. But it's like, I'm sitting there, it's like, uh, I'm sorry, but if I was behaving like them, I can't believe I had to pay a whole 63 cents in federal carbon charges to heat my home for 32 days. Thanks, Trudeau. This is outrageous. Really yeah, amazing. <laughs> Less than a cup of coffee. Life in Trudeau's Canada. Get a damn heat pump. Yeah. <laughs> Get a heat pump and, oh, there was a, a rebate for heat pumps. Like there was a whole plan around. Yes. Yes. And, and thank you for the, the 5000 to $6,500. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the, and the, 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 the interest-free loan. Mm-hmm. Especially considering what interest rates are at now. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well done. Damn Trudeau. Making, making heat pumps. Simpler. Making, making heat pumps affordable. Reducing my carbon fee. Making me reduce the amount of GHGs I put at. Making me a responsible citizen of the pl- Damn you! What an arse. Christ, what an asshole. <laughs> Making me be good against my own damn will. Mm-hmm. Making me make common sense financial decisions. How dare he? Yeah, I know. It's, it's, it's um, ludicrous. It's absurd. It's beyond belief that people would doctor things to make themselves look like, I don't know, victims. Can, can, can you tell my rage is sincere? Oh, yeah, yeah, I see it. I see it. Acting. I see it. Jeez. <laughs> Jeez, just, uh, this guy. Yeah. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. It's just so with that, I think we've finally done the whole round of the budget. This is actually one of the most interesting budgets I've seen in a good long time. Not since the children, the alleged children's budget that Jean Chrétien put in back in the day when the National Child Benefit, which is now the Canada Child Benefit, came around and the National Action Plan uh, for Children. And uh, when the, uh, when daycare was introduced the first time, when Ken Dryden was the Minister of Social Services. Um, uh, sorry, Human Resources and Development, I should say, specifically. Um, when that was all proposed, uh, that year there was a whole suite of stuff. It was actually called the Children's Budget, and I know that because, uh, well, <laughs> turns out that I was in the federal government when I was a public servant. Mm-hmm. I was the communications person working for Health and uh, Human Resource Development Canada, who was the point person in the department on everything related to children or the children's budget. So you, you, what you're saying is you, you have some experience in that area? I did the comms on it at the departmental level, in the program level. Not at the ministerial level. I did the comms on that one. Not since that budget has there been one that's been talked about like this one. It's a significant budget. It's a significant budget. (sighs) Speaking about, and just a little note on corporate greed, a little news thing that I saw the other day that uh, came out. it seems that people that uh, bought gift cards online using their CIBC visa, mm-hmm. they got their bills and found out that when they were buying e-gift cards online, not gift cards when you know you go to an actual Tim Horton buy gift card, but electronic ones, you're buying them online, they were being charged an extra $5 fee. So buy a $10 gift what? card, all of a sudden pay $15. If you bought them online or through an app, because someone suddenly decided that you paying with your credit card, which mm-hmm. means all the money comes out right, for a gift card was considered as you taking a cash advance. Oh, cute. So they're going to ding you on interest. Yes. Well, a fee and then interest because cash advance are. You get yes. charged interest from the second you take it out. You don't get the 30 day grace period. If you pay your entire credit card on, on time without interest. Bit of a, 
bit of yeah. a greasy bit on their part. I yeah. Think, you think? yeah. Now CIBC is not saying whether it was someone at the bank or the company selling the gift cards, but I don't know why it would be the latter. I don't know why it's the company selling the gift cards would want to make it harder to sell the gift cards by tacking an extra $5 fee on it. Doesn't make so I'm going to go out on a limb and assume it's someone from the bank. But CIBC is not saying whether someone at the bank or the company selling the gift cards was the one who added the fee. CABC says that the fee will now long, no longer apply and automatic refunds will be ordered. But UBC business professor Murali Shandashankaran says, it is totally unfair. Making money is important, but it's also important to make it fairly with honesty so that you treat everyone with dignity. When you pay in full for a gift card and the money comes off your credit card and it's guaranteed that you're supposed to be good for it, Treating that, the money that was on the gift card, as a cash advance taken out on your credit card is pretty freaking underhanded, twisted, torqued, and sneaky. And they did not announce it. The bill, the, the charge just started to appear. Funny how that works out, eh? A bank. Well, if because they they're suffering. Scam you, they will. Yeah. Bank only cares about the bank. If you think they actually care about you, as, as a client, as a human being? No, they don't. You're, you're just a means to an end for them. That's all. You are a wallet. Nothing more. That's it. Pretty much it. Banks don't give a damn about anything but the bank. If you don't realize that, well, now you do. Yeah. Indeed. So when you're looking at this, uh, you know, I was watching all the analysis and uh, Althea Raj made a comment that I thought was really good and says, it looks like the prime minister is actually looking for a fight. Hmm. With all these little policies that go somewhere, touching some provincial jurisdiction, taxing the rich, mm -hmm. insisting on the climate policy. He's looking for a fight, but he chose his terrain, capital gains, taxing mm -hmm. the rich, wanting to provide a national school food program, wanting to actually build houses, oppose that, stand against that, go ahead, fight with him, be on the position, be on the side against the school food program. Be on the side against making the rich pay more. Be on the side of wanting to add extra layers of bureaucracy before building housing. Be on the side of wanting to have a jurisdictional squabble and go to court and spend lots of money rather than actually just doing the work. Mm. There's some rope-a-dope going on here. Oh yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Fight with the prime minister. I see what I'm Come on, bring it on. <laughs> Throw a punch. There's some very, if you, if you like strategy and you like a chessboard and you like seeing the pieces on the chessboard moving, this right now is an extremely interesting time. This is the reason when I say, you know, there are people that hate politics and people love politics. This is the reason I love politics. Mm. I love seeing this back and forth, the parry and thrust, where we're moving. Who's playing the long game? Who's playing the short game? On this one, I've been saying for since we started the show, the prime minister strikes me as someone who plays the long game. And the timing for certain things is very important. Again, if you're in the boxing ring and you come out, and you just start throwing haymakers, swing, 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 and you never have any defense. You never make them, you know, move around the rings. You never get them around the ropes. You never, you know, duck and bob and weave. Right? You're going to tie yourself out. Mm -hmm. You got to manage your energy. You got to wait for an opening. You got to take a swing. But sometimes you got to be on defense. So if the prime minister actually does do politics the way he boxes. 
Oh yeah. He's basically Muhammad Ali experience. on the Muhammad Ali on the ropes going. Yeah, come on, come on. Go ahead, come on. Take a swing, take a swing. <laughs> right now. Go ahead. Hit me with your best shot. Let's see what you got. And um, well, I'm thinking the Prime Minister might be in a better spot because um, well, the Prime Minister has some backup. And this is something, uh, Mr. Grizzly, that I know you will want to show because we talked about it earlier in the week. And uh, this is uh, our uh, rapidly becoming favorite person, Sean Fraser. Let me bring this up. Um, showing that um, he can uh, serve oh, yeah. with the best of them. Oh, yeah. This moment if you haven't seen it yet makes me very 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 happy it's, it's good <laughs> it's good the, the amount of people are saying oh there's the next prime minister i'm like settle down settle down he could be one day if he, he decides he day. wants to but you know he's got to be he's not the party leader so let's mm -hmm. hold your breath he's right? so tall dark and very handsome <laughs> <laughs> so good. all right let's have a look at this this is good why won't they realize that they're the problem and not the solution? The Honorable Minister for Housing, Infrastructure and Communities. Mr. Speaker, the leader of the opposition has been masquerading across the country as a working class hero, but it's fascinating when you actually listen to what he thinks people do for a living. In a couple of recent speeches, he said he thinks electricians capture electricity from the sky and that welders weld with their bare hands. What's he going to tell me next? The fishermen of my community dive beneath the ocean and catch them with their bare teeth? Mr. Speaker, I can forgive the opposition leader for being a career politician who's been on the public dime for a couple of decades, but if he wants to represent the interests of the working class, he should talk to a person who has a real job. Why won't they realize that they're the problem? Damn, the shade. Woo. Lord, the shade. Oh, jeez. How yeah. do you like them apples? Mm. Or how do you like them? How do you like that turbot? <laughs> well, I have a, because uh, we're in the House of Commons, I have a clip for you that I don't know if you have seen. Okay. Uh, this took place, was this yesterday? I think it was yesterday. I think it was yesterday. Yeah, 22 hours ago is when this was posted. I don't know exactly. I'm going to suggest that this took place yesterday. Okay. And um, just watch what transpires. It's one minute and 26 seconds. And mm. it's, uh, mm. it's a call out. Mm. I've served many years with you, Mr. Speaker, but my concern is very serious about the fact that members who are asking questions are silenced again and again by the Conservatives. So out of respect, I will not withdraw, and I don't mean that personally. So sad that the Conservatives have very sensitive feelings about it. Chair, I'm going to have to ask the Honourable Member please to leave the chamber. member from Winnipeg Centre. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and we've had the occasion to speak about exactly what is going on uh, in the House. I have to say myself, on Thursday of last week, I felt that I behaved in an unparliamentary way as well, because it is un out of control on the Conservative side of the bench, constant toxic masculinity, yes. including yes. Uh, harassing the member from Nunavut, yes. which I found so offensive. What I find shocking, Mr. Speaker, with all due respect, is that this is the first occasion where this kind of severe response has been taken, yet there is a normalization of gender-based violence being perpetrated by Conservative members on that side that happens every single day in this House all day. And it's true. It's true. That lady who's speaking is MP Leah Gazan from the NDP, who for whom we have all the time in the world. Mm -hmm. right? She is the one that got unanimous support for a private member's bill mm -hmm. for red dress alerts. Yeah. You know how hard it is to get unanimous support for private, well, how, first of all, to get a private member's bill passed in the first place and then get passed with unanimous support. 
If you live in her writing, vote for the person. Li Gazan deserves her vote. You vote for the person there. And when she's talking about the member from Nunavut, well, let's remind you who the member from Nunavut is. Mr. Grizzly. Oh, sorry. I didn't see sorry. that. Oops. I... There we go. Lori Idlet. She's Inuit. Mm -hmm. Inuk. Inuk, sorry. Damn, I keep on getting that wrong. That's okay. Old I will learn eventually. Hard. I will learn. I will learn. Uh, Inuk. Uh, and, and you will Kathy, notice... I'd love, to, I'd love to be able to answer this question. She is magnificent, but I want to know what was said before. I don't know. We don't know. Um, unfortunately. Uh, but my take is maybe not something specifically that was said, although there might have been something. But uh, in my watching of question period... And if you watch it uh, over a couple of days, if you spend one week watching it, you will uh, notice that when women stand up to speak, the conservative benches tend to get louder. Mm -hmm. Every single time. Oh, I, I saw something yesterday that I thought was appropriate. Um, it, it's taken from a film, but it's, it's written out in a, in a lovely uh, quotation. And I think somebody said... <laughs> They suggested that every time Pierre Polyev goes on a rambling speech, we should respond with this. Mr. Polyev, what you've just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. That's from uh, an Adam Sandler flick, who's uh, Billy Madison. Billy Madison, yep. And yeah. and that that that's how you should respond to him every single time, because, yeah. well, have you seen the lie counter that JB? Yes, he, he got one the other day. He lied a hundred and eight times. No, not well, conservatives. Here, the conservatives lied a hundred and eight times in the House of Commons. Yeah, and somebody's like, "Oh, what's a bell mean?" It's like, well, actually, if you go to this site right here, it'll show you what they said and the fact that shows that they lied. So he's not just saying, oh, that's a lie, that's a lie, that's a lie. It's like, no, 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 that was a lie, and here's why. Here's the proof that he lied, or that person lied. So, well done, sir. Yep. Well done, JB. We appreciate that. We need a Daniel Dale doing the, the good work in this country to call them out each time. Exactly. So that's JB's doing it. Exactly. That's what I mentioned on the, on the web. It says, you know, JB sliding into Daniel Dale's position because it seems that Trump's running again and the United States are not going to let us, no. not, they're not going to give us Daniel back. So <laughs> there's a position that needs to be filled. <laughs> well, and Cassie's statement here, Greg, Greg Fergus needs to be more aggressive and not so mild in the house. And, and we agree. Mm. We agree. I'm not sure about that. I'm not I sure. That tone that he had right there is the good one. Yes, but, but but he's letting he's letting the conservatives do, run rampant, and he's never calling them out. Yeah, right. And but, that's the thing. But here's here's my take on it: why he doesn't, because he was a liberal member of parliament. If he calls the cons out, they're immediately going to cry wolf. Yep. Well, there's also tone and countertone. Mm -hmm. PP is completely smarmy. Oh yeah. He's unpleasant. Yeah. Period. And he doesn't know how to tell a joke. Clearly, because he's completely humorless. So this thing, what's he going to do? Tell us that the fishermen in my writing go down there and catch them with their bare teeth? That's the tone. That's the yes. countertone. Mm -hmm. It's not aggressive. It's not angry. It's literally, that was just the dumbest shit I just heard. What are you going to tell me? Some other dumb shit? Mm -hmm. Laughing. Mocking. Cutting them down. Making them look smaller. Making them look dumber. It's not difficult. Making him look an insipid, insignificant. It's not difficult to do that with him. <laughs> it's always a battle between tone and counter tone. Yes, yeah, sometimes you need to give it back just as hard, right back in the teeth. Mm -hmm. But it's choosing the proper counter tone. That's where you win the battle. Now, we're talking about Sean Fraser. Got a little something else for you. Oh, what's that? 
Oh, yes. We got some shots. Uh, because before the budget came out, when they were doing the pre announcement tour, mm -hmm. there was mm -hmm. one day where he announced like the whole, like a big part of the housing strategy. And then uh, he made a little video to sell it. Now, you will notice that when he did that response in the House of Commons, by the way, no notes. Mm -hmm. You didn't have to read. You didn't have to read to deliver all of that. All right. Let's watch this one. I don't have it. Oh, sorry. I put it in the private chat for you, the, the link. Oh, okay. There we go. Sorry there. Um, again, no, I'm... <sighs> again, I I like looking at this man. I have to say. <laughs> yes, so, I, I might be a little not totally objective. <laughs> yeah, a little bit, little bit of bias, maybe? A little bit. Listen, hey, my bias is towards tall to start with. So, <laughs> so already. We're living through a housing down. crisis, but we can solve it. Here's how we're going to do it we're going to build more homes. One way we can help is cutting taxes on home builders. We've removed the GST from new apartment construction and we're putting new measures in place, like the ones that Canada used in the 1970s to help set a record level of home building. We've done it before and we can do it again. We need to change the way that we build homes. There's not a lot of industries that still build things the way they did a century ago. Most of them have figured out new technologies, new processes that allows them to scale up production. We want to do the same thing when it comes to home building. We're going to make sure it's easier to rent or buy a place to live. If you're building your first home, we're changing the rules around mortgages so you can spread your payment over a longer time, over 30 years instead of 25, so your monthly mortgage payment comes down. If you rent, we also want to help you. We're putting forward a renter's bill of rights to help put a floor of protections under everybody who rents in this country. We're going to make sure that we help the people who can't afford a home. We can build a Canada where we read about homelessness in our history books and not our newspapers. I want to help solve the housing crisis. And honestly, I believe we can. This plan is going to help us get there. Well, he's you know, good, man. Let's see if we can get let's see if we can get him on the show. Uh, if you want to know, by the way, if you want to know more about the housing thing, um, uh, I'm going to be plugging another podcast, but Peter Mansbridge, uh, uh, podcast, the bridge, uh, mm -hmm. minister Fraser was on the show the other day, taking people, uh, he had asked, uh, Peter Mansbridge had asked people to send in their questions about housing. And for the entire time that he's there, he's answering the, the questions. So he doesn't know what's coming in. He doesn't know what's, he doesn't know what's coming in. Yeah. Yeah, he's done coming in, but uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, uh, if you want to hear more about him and you're interested on the sub uh, on the subject of housing, to check out Peter Mansbridge, the Bridge. I think it was uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, they had Sean Fraser on, and uh, he was there. So, basically, I think it's called Sean Fraser answers uh, your questions on housing or something. He's from Nova uh, Scotia. Correct me if I'm wrong. Well, again, tall, dark, handsome, smart, has a sense of humor. From the East Coast, uh, what's not to like? <laughs> if I was already taken, if I was not already taken, and he wasn't always already, because I'm not a home wrecker, mm -hmm. I'd be sending him some fan mail. I have to say, <laughs> I, I, I if he's not, it's like I don't know why anybody hasn't scooped that up yet. That's all I'll say. <laughs> I don't know. See if I can find out here. I, I, I would assume he is. I would just I would just assume that somebody who looks and who looks like that speaks like that and thinks like that is not on the market. <laughs> but Mr. Grizzly, if you if you do want to give me hope in case one day. <laughs> well, let's oh, see man. here. It doesn't uh, say if he's got a spouse. Uh does it? Uh, no, it, it talks about uh, personal details. Uh, he may not be. He spouse, Sarah Burton. Ah, there you go. See? Yeah. Good job, Sarah. <laughs> well, he turns, uh, he'll, he'll turn 40 on June 1st. Yeah. So, hey, 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 hey. All I know, let's just put it this way. Politically, he turns me on and he's not hard to look at. So well, and, and two for two. And so it can make we, me laugh. We have millennials uh, in the House of Commons who are, are getting shit done, right? Yeah, getting wow. it 
done. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, and there's, there's more stuff uh, from Sean. I mean, if you're on his Twitter feed, almost every video he has on there is like pretty much worth watching. So his comms is great. His, his comms are great. Yeah. I wonder if he, is he, you know, I'm sure, he, well, he has a team to do the video on that, but I wonder if he is a comms person or if he's doing a lot himself. And I question that. I, I pose that question because um, he's genuine, mm -hmm. right? You, yep. you can't fake that unless yep. you're a professional actor and most politicians aren't. And remember, politics is show business for ugly people, but he doesn't fall into the ugly category. So <laughs> mm. He's fine. He's just so fine. Settle down. <laughs> we want to get him on the show. You don't want to be hitting on the man while he's... It's like it's like, hello, welcome to the Daily Beaver interview show. We have Sean Fraser. Let me ask you your first question. How does it feel to be so fat? <laughs> we're, not, we're, not, we're not doing that. <laughs> now, I, I I'm going to ask you a question. Me. Yeah, yeah, Nathaniel Erskine Smith, too. I'm going to sit there. Little, and now I'm going to ask you a question. And I just want you to know before you answer that I won't actually be paying attention. I'll just be watching your mouth as you speak. Mm. Go. <laughs> yeah, it, it, probably wouldn't be. It's not I, going I, to get anybody on the show, dude. <laughs> I Let's, promise. Let me sexually harass you on the show. No, no, we're not. We're not. Mr. Doing Fraser, that. I promise that if you ever do the show, I will be a perfect gentle beaver. <laughs> and well, better be. I'll have to give you a smack. I don't like hitting people. So. Kid Saucy goes. Douglas had genuine disappointment in his voice when he heard Sarah's name. Hey. <laughs> Game respects game. She got there first. Mm. <laughs> Good for you, Sarah. Good for you. And I, I have no, I have no doubt that Sarah is probably quite impressive in her own right. Yes, yes. yes. What Jen says: Don't sexualize the guests. <laughs> don't sexualize the guests. Speaking about not sexualizing the guest, Donald Trump. Uh, <laughs> well, we're never having that piece of human fecal matter on the show. <laughs> I don't care Ooh. if it would bring in a billion ratings. I don't want to be within the vicinity of that disgusting human being. Not even with a thousand foot pole. Nope. <laughs> so, kids and cups, um, as you know, or as you may have heard, Donald Trump is in court. <laughs> kind of, sort of. Because um, for the guy who kept on saying, calling uh, Joe Biden Sleepy Joe, uh, he sure has a lot of trouble staying awake in court. Now, I don't know if that, I'm sorry, I'm going to be really mean here. I don't know if that has um, anything to do with the fact that since he's in court and he has to keep his ass crazy glued down into the seat the entire time he's there four days a week, he can't go and take an Adderall break. So I don't know if he's binging when he gets back home at night and then basically when he gets to court, he's crashing. So there he's falling asleep. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it seems at least for the first two days uh, that he was in court, at some point he is... Uh, huh? Yeah. And it, it appears, which has um, uh, gotten some people to have a field day with uh, names for him, like a Don Snorleone. Yeah, I saw that one. That was pretty good, I thought. Or, Dozy Don <laughs> instead of a Sleepy Joe. Um, and uh, it seems as well that, uh, and this has happened a couple of times when he was uh, president, uh, where he has uh, been talking and all of a sudden you hear um, a little sound. Maybe he had a couple of taco bowls and ate a little too much of the magical fruit. Beans, beans, the musical fruit. But apparently, um, it seems, and again, this is not something that we should be laughing about, but it's Donald Trump, so it's like, geez. Mm -hmm. uh, apparently, he has some flatulence issues, so apparently in court, he's been farting while he sleeps. <laughs> farting while you sleep. Farting while you sleep. Isn't that and, a song? That's a country song. And there's been lots of um, sort of uh, memes, so... Um, uh, so does anybody have the over or under on whether or not he falls asleep again? And oh yeah, we I bet you they're taking bets in Vegas on that. Shit. I, I'm serious. In Vegas, you can bet on anything. And I'm sitting there and going like this. And can we add the can we add the farting parlay? Because <laughs> I just 
Will they be <laughs> wet, so dry, funny. loud? What's the deal? Well, he <laughs> shits his pants constantly, right? Well, no, he really does. He really does. Uh, it's not. It's not a secret. It's. I'm not trying to embarrass the man. He shits his pants constantly because of the amount of medication that he takes. It's yes. the Adderall, Adderall or the uh, the benzo, whatever it is. Whatever it is. Speed and then, basically, and he can't control his bowels yes. as a result. Yeah. And you know, and and we've seen photos. You know, the the, the famous one with him playing tennis, where yeah. it's clear he is wearing a diaper. Well, a, and and it's yeah. not it's not due to his age, by the way, Dan. This has been going on for like thirty years. Yeah. See, Kid Vim says, I heard Trump smells bad. I would assume that he smells of farts, cheeseburger burps, and stale flops wet. Mm. That would be my guess. But hey, that's just me. So, now that we've had our fun. <laughs> oh, Kid James, imagine he died in court. Everyone thinks he's asleep. Nobody wants to wake him and he just stays there overnight. <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, oh, that's so cruel. Oh, my God. Okay, okay. We've had our fun. <laughs> It's just so easy. And, and I understand I'm being a small, 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 petty person, but we've endured years of him. This yeah. is the return on investment. Let me have this. This is called consequences <laughs> just, for one's actions. It's just, I've never, I try to be a good person, but I've never said I actually was. So mm. let me have this. Because <laughs> when it comes to Trump, I'm sorry. I just. Oh I I need this. I need to be petty. Okay, I get it. So I, I I put it all in that bucket so that I can remain the lovely, wonderful beaver you all enjoy on every other subject. <laughs> okay, so he's in court. Uh, there are gag orders because well, the only thing this man can run is his mouth. Um. And, you know, his whole thing is sort of basically not touching you, not touching you. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Oh, well, you didn't say I couldn't say nasty shit about your daughter. So, hey, oh, now I can't say nasty shit about your daughter. So how about if I post a newspaper article about somebody else saying nasty shit about your daughter? Is that okay? So like this or, you know, this is the game he plays, right? So, and uh, uh, Stephen Colbert uh, actually made a joke the other day and uh, it was like uh, because uh, the prosecution is saying well he's already violated the gag order three times and they're asking for a consequence of this one thousand dollar fine for each time he does it for donald trump who goes to a mic and says oh my god they find me a thousand dollars send me money and he gets ten thousand like, this is not actually a deterrent but stephen colbert uh made the joke says well yeah, i guess three thousand dollars is fitting k k k <laughs> <laughs> That's just, mm -hmm. It made me think of if Trump was a baseball pitcher, he would quit every game after he threw three strikes. <clears throat> for those who are not in the know, the symbol for a strike is the letter K. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, yes, he's not supposed to make comments about uh, the daughter. He's not supposed to make comments about... Uh, the staff, I think the only person he can make comments about is basically the DA and the judge, but not the witnesses or anything. But despite he couldn't do that, Trump reposted a New York Post story stating that Michael Cohen was a serial perjurer. The DA argues that Trump's in violation of his gag order. Judge Mershon will actually have a hearing on these violations of his gag order next week. Um... The case is expected to be in court until June. Jury selection was scheduled, uh, might have taken a full week, because uh, that was the step one. Uh, they need, uh, it's not just 12 jurors they need, they need 18. So they need 12 jurors and six alternates in case there's something going on. There were 500 prospective jury candidates uh, brought in, and there was a 42-page questionnaire to fill out with questions such as, you know, where do you get your new source? Uh, they didn't ask people if uh, they voted for Trump or not, uh, stuff like that. But, you know, have you ever been a member of the Proud Boys or mm -hmm. you know, an affiliation? Where do you get your news? That type of stuff. Um, uh, the court, uh, Judge Mershon warned Trump, you have the right to be present during the trial, but you can lose that right if you disrupt the proceedings in any way. The court permits me to expel you and send you to jail. 
He also informed Trump that he could not attend arguments in the Supreme Court case because in a, there's a Supreme Court case that's going on and they're making some arguments about whether or not they can do things on procedure or you know things that they're fighting before the case actually starts. It's like, no, you can't go there for that. You need to be here because here you are a criminal defendant. In the civil court, you don't need to be there for the trial, which is why he avoided E. Jean Carroll, but this is a criminal trial. So your butt needs to be in that chair and you are obligated to be in the New York City courthouse during your trial. Trump will have Wednesdays and weekends off to campaign, but the rest of the time, four days a week, he will have to be in court. Now, on the first day, even though everything was supposed to start at 9.30, the first group of 96 jurors were not uh, done being sworn in and processed until 2.30 in the afternoon, and uh, a lot of that had to do with both sides arguing about what evidence could be heard, which delayed procedures. 96 jurors were brought in on the first day. Judge Juan Marchand asked them if they were capable of being fair and impartial. That's the first one. But more than half of them lift up, lifted up their hands saying that they could not, and they were dismissed. Uh, there were about nine others that couldn't serve for any other reasons, leaving about a third of the original group. Of those nine, of those nine only made it through the initial vetting process before court was adjourned. And they would be questioned further. Um, so this has uh, continued. It seems that now they do have, uh, as of yesterday, they had 12 jurors and one alternate. So they're looking for five more alternates, which is actually uh, a little faster than they thought uh, might happen to get at that point because they thought maybe would have, the jury selection process could possibly go into next week. They knew it was going to take all of this week, though, however. Because, I mean, it is kind of hard to find a person who has never heard of the case. And it's not a question of never having heard of the case. It's just whether or not, regardless of what you've heard of the case, do you think you're capable of being fair and impartial, right. which is the criteria. Uh, many illegal anal analysis are saying that if he is convicted, given it is his first conviction for crime, which just blows my mind, uh, considering that he's like a one-man crime spree and has had a whole life of crime, but you know, at 70 something, finally, it will be his first conviction. And that given this is a low level uh, felony offense, the doctoring of documents, uh, he might be looking at a sentence from probation to three years, which means there's a very good chance he might not even get any jail time for this. He's charged on 34 felony counts, uh, each one of them with a maximum of four years. But then, you know, there's all the, the mitigation things that, uh, that put it down. Um, the falsifying of documents, which is the crime, uh, mm -hmm. that he's being charged for in and of itself is only a misdemeanor, which is why people are thinking that he would uh, maybe only get probation. But it only became a felony because that crime was done, committed to conceal another crime. And the crime was reporting the $130,000 as a business expense because it wasn't a business expense. Michael Cohen paid the $130,000 that Donald Trump wrote checks reimbursing Michael Cohen. Right. That was not for legal fees. He declared them as legal fees, as a business expense. It wasn't legal fees. It was hush money. It was bribe. Pro tip, don't try to write off your bribes. Just saying. Don't declare your bribes on your taxes <laughs> if you don't want to get caught. Not a particularly smart criminal. Let's put it that way. And then the second lie he broke was campaign finance violations because $130,000 is exceeds the maximum limit one person can contribute to a campaign. Which is why he didn't try to write it off as campaign expense. He tried to write it off as a business expense, as legal fees. So he doctored the documents to conceal an election campaign finance crime and a tax crime. That's why he's being charged as felonies and not as misdemeanors. So, um, what else do we have here with you? So yes, the 12 jurors, one alternate have been uh, sworn in. Um, two of the jurors that had been previously sworn in were dismissed. One after she expressed new doubt in her ability to be fair and impartial. She you know, had a nice time to think about it overnight and says, yeah, you know what? I probably know too much is what she said. And then the second one uh, had uh, concerns about disclosure of her identity and other uh, concerns that may, uh, yeah, and, sorry, and she had problems, uh, concerns about disclosure of her identity because it seems that even though the judge has issued an order for nobody at all to share any information about the witness, and you have to understand that uh, Donald Trump is actually being tried 
uh, by an anonymous jury. The judge has decided that Donald Trump will not know the identity of the jurors because he kind of has a long track record of intimidating witnesses. Oh, yes. So, but it seems that despite that, there were certain bits of information that the press got and the press decided to publish that made it possible to identify some of the jurors. Which goes exactly against the purpose and the reason why the judge tried to make an anonymous jury. Media. I know you want to get the story, but if the judge decides the jury's going to be anonymous, maybe not try to find out who the jurors are so you can reveal their identities. Let's all row in the same direction, eh? Maybe. Um, so, you know, there were some people that had been identified and some people decided, yeah, well, sorry, now I'm out. <laughs> and a uh, second one, well, uh, said uh, they may not have been completely truthful about whether or not they had been accused or convicted of a crime. Other pro tip, don't lie to get on to jury duty. Just the hint. These are not good moves. So uh, the lawyers now have to select the five alternates to round up the panel that will decide the first ever criminal case against a former U.S. president. So uh, that's what's going on. Um, there's a whole bunch of other drama with regard to the case and whatnot, and motions and delays and whatnot. He's losing everyone, so you know we'll just let him cry himself out. But uh, yes, it seems that Sir Fartzalot is going to be indeed tried and uh, the judge, and it seems that all the higher judges that he's going to to make all these like little cases, like none of them are hearing any of it. They're, they're not interested. Some of them are just like, yeah, okay, uh, you made your case. We heard the thing. Okay, we're going to give you our decision now. No. Okay. <laughs> you got another one that we can deal with in the next 10 minutes? Because it's going to be no too. But hey, make your case if you want to. Because this case is starting on the day it's scheduled to start no matter what you do. But So, um, so there you go. Donald Trump, sit back, grab your popcorn, enjoy the return on investment. You had the two years since he went down the escalator and you had the four years he was president and you've had like the nearly four years since of watching him do whatever he's doing. He's finally being tried criminally. This is what you paid for. Those a lot these last nine years of suffering and torture. This is your reward. <laughs> Enjoy it. <sighs> Meanwhile, back home in Canada, it seems that we have in Quebec dueling referendum. <laughs> we uh, talked to you uh, the other day about um, Premier Legault wanting to uh, have a referendum on stuff like immigration measures and that type of stuff, right? He threatened a referendum because, you know, he's not, um, well, not doing all that well in the polls and he's trying to, uh, you know, trying to do well. Well, it seems that uh, the Parti Québécois leader, and I'm not sure if this is a particularly smart move on his part, Paul Saint-Pierre Plamondon, um, he has come out and said that, yes, he does want a referendum on separation. He wants one. And that he's going to push for one in uh, the next, if he wins. Now, one of the reasons that uh, the Parti Québécois, uh, at least before it like really, really tanked after the, the second Charlotte, uh, the, the second referendum, uh, the 1995 referendum, the Parti Québécois uh, position was always, yes, we still do believe in sovereignty. Yes, absolutely. We do. But, um, it's not, if we're going to do something on this, it's not going to be for the first, our first term. It might be something that we'll do on a, an, on another term. So we are still interested in it, but it's not for now. So you can vote for us. Let's say if you're more nationalist or more autonomous, but you're not a separatist, don't worry. You can vote for us, the Parti Québécois, because we will not be trying to start a referendum in our first mandate. So your vote is safe. Um, 
Well, Paul Saint Pierre Plamondon um, is not at all taking that tack. He's saying that there will be one. And uh, I sent you a, a link there, Mr. Grizzly, because there's a, a small interview with him uh, embedded in it that I would like to play because um, he is doing this in a very, 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 um, he's doing it in a way that sends chills up and down my spine. Oh. Uh, yeah. The debate in Quebec has always been uh, Maître Chinou, masters of our own domain, mm -hmm. king of kings of our own castles. Uh, we want to make the decisions in our own home. Uh, and then for the Bloc Québécois, for the longest time, it's been an uh, issue of, uh, you know, Quebec is not better or worse than Canada. We're not, I guess we're just different. Right? We're not superior. We're not inferior. We're just different. So we want to do things a different way. Uh, this guy is taking... Uh, I would say the avenue of uh, the oppressor and the oppressed. And uh, basically constantly painting Canada as being some really malevolent, oppressive force that they need to get out from under. And um, one of the things about Paul Saint-Pierre Plamondon is that he has developed a reputation up until now for not being someone that uh, breaks out into hyperbole and uh, says wild and crazy things and uh, doesn't seem to get um, over the top animated. Right. Um, so it starts to come across as casual and uh, actual rational and calm discourse. Uh, but it's dangerous discourse. Uh, Mr. Grizzly, uh, I don't know if you've got it set up. Yeah, I do. Okay. Uh, let's play this. It's a couple of minutes, but you need to know what's going on there d'années de violence contre les francophones, mais tout particulièrement contre les peuples autochtones. Tel est le vrai visage de ce régime. C'était comme ça il y a 100 ans, ça va être comme ça aujourd'hui, demain. Ce régime ne changera pas, c'est un régime qui ne sait qu'écraser ceux qui refusent de s'assimiler. That was part of a speech made by the leader of the Parti Québécois, Paul Saint-Pierre Plamondon, at a party convention over the weekend. He joins us now from Quebec City. Thank you very much for joining us today. Pleasure. Now, as you heard, of course, in your speech, you accused the federal government of abusing its power over immigration, of not giving Quebec more power specifically because it wants to destabilize Quebec. You accuse Ottawa of being a regime that crushes those who refuse to assimilate uh, and will continue to do so. Mr. Saint-Pierre Plamondon, did you go too far in your speech over the weekend? I don't think so. The uh, extract we just heard was on the specific topic of God Save the King uh, at the Parliament uh, uh, in Ottawa. Uh, an Acadian elected member of Parliament asked for to do like in Quebec and to stop with the oath to the king. And not only it didn't pass, but uh, elected members, uh, conservatives, started singing God Save the King. And that's a reference to British colonialism. And uh, it's a, a well-known fact that that history comes with uh, oppression towards uh, Francophones and First Nations. To say that is not uh, going too far. It's just a historical fact. And unfortunately, over the past month, we've seen the Trudeau government uh, continuing to grab powers from provinces, not respecting the Constitution by using its spending power to decide in the stead, in the place of provinces. And in the case of Quebec, while it raises issues of uh, democracy and viability of uh, uh, the specificity of Quebec over time. But you, you go to the point where you say, unless the province separates, the Quebec nation will cease to exist. That's my reading based on the uh, fate of uh, Francophones in all other Canadian provinces. Um, and um, on the fact that Canada is cheating its own fundamental rules, that this regime doesn't respect the Constitution, in which case, no, I don't think having just a fifth of the seats in Ottawa 
will provide Quebec any future, deciding by ourselves, having 100% of the democrat democratic power, yes, it will provide us with uh, sustainability and uh, financial powers, financial power that we are lacking right now because Ottawa is taking almost half of our tax income for little services or no services, in which case I think we can do better. Uh, what many Quebecers have loved about you as the leader of the PQ is, is a, a fresh approach. You're a straight talker, without hyperbole, you're progressive. The speech over the weekend and then a news conference that uh, followed that speech, you've been criticized by media in general, francophone, anglophone, uh, as being radical, negative, fear-mongering, alarmist. Uh, I mean, you have your supporters, and I know you want to hold a referendum on sovereignty uh, by 2030. Uh, with support around 33, 35 percent, do you think that kind of a speech inspires young Quebecers and, and, and others in the province to join your campaign? Well, two things. Uh, those comments are from my adversaries, my opponents. They're from other political parties who want to uh, want me to uh, not sustain the uh, positive polls I have right now. And columnists. As for the youth, and columnists in the media. A few, but not all. Uh, and, uh, of course, those who are against the independence of Quebec will not have the same opinion than those who are in favor. As for the youth, um, I really think that discussing history to try to understand the present and the future is not radical. And we shouldn't say that youth, young people in general, are happy to be disconnected with notions of history. And whether it's the First Nations or the Francophones, it's just a fact that the colonial, British colonial regime that became Canada in 1867 has been on several occasions not respectful or hostile. Uh, to those groups. And uh, we need to be reading this cheating of the Constitution under Justin Trudeau with the long history of Canada and speci specifically, specifically the history of his father, Pierre-Elia Trudeau, who was uh, uh, hostile to certain uh, of uh, Quebec's uh, uh, demands. And uh, that uh, is in a form of continuation. Also, although, of course, Things change through centuries, but some things are indeed constant, and knowing history is not a bad thing for the youth as as far as I'm concerned. But linking all of that, and, and I'm not saying that you made a direct link to from violence and executions to Pierre Elliott Trudeau and uh, Justin Trudeau, but just putting them in the same context, uh, there has been criticism about that. Oh, yeah, but uh, of course... If we talk about uh, difficult moments in history, because we could talk about pierre Elia Trudeau and the uh, period where members of the Parti Québécois got arrested. Uh, we can talk about the federal government spying the Parti Québécois. Of course, when we raise things that actually happen but are uncomfortable, uh, there will be some reactions. And it doesn't mean that cannot be constructive uh, and positive on other topics. But will I prevent myself from talking ab about historical events that are verified and actually true for understanding the present. I think it would be a big mis mistake on my part, and I think I should have the right to uh, mention historical events uh, when they're actually uh, true. All right. Paul Saint-Pierre uh, Plamondon, we're going to have to leave it there, but thank you for coming on the program. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Kit Jillian just put it right there. I don't like the combination of good looks, looks, moderate tone, and... This man's dangerous. Yeah. This man is exact, and this man is exactly in the political cycle where PP was when he started attacking the prime minister about a year ago. Mm -hmm. Next Quebec election is October 2026. Yeah, Just over two years. Mm -hmm. Two years of the constant drumbeat of you are living under an oppressive regime that will never stop until you are completely crushed and assimilated. None of that's going to happen. But that's his line. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then meanwhile, you've got the CAC leader now going, the federal government does not want to allow us to control our own immigration and whatnot because we need a referendum on that. So you've got both of them. The leader, the two leaders of the major parties for the next two years are going to be beating a drumbeat in the province of Quebec. Mm -hmm. That they are living under an oppressive regime that is seeking to crush them until they are completely assimilated. That's pretty that funny when you consider who the cosmic. prime minister is, right? Because the prime minister has talked about Quebec ad nauseum. Yeah. 
Now, in positive the, light is yeah. what I'm getting, you know. Yeah. And this is what I'm saying. So up until now, he has been seen as calm and rational, not a night, har- night harper. Anymore. He threw that out uh, the window. Harper. He threw it out the window with this one. Now, of course, he makes this tone. But then he said like this, like, I think I should have the right to talk about historicalism. Like, nobody's saying you don't have the right. Nobody's taking that away from you. But, but, but you're torquing them. You're talking mm-hmm. them a little, and he's putting them, he's putting francophones in the same basket as indigenous Canadians. He's, he's Robert fifing it. He's fifing it. Yeah. Well, we're going to start calling stories and, and things that get torqued fifing. Yeah. So um, this is a departure, and it's a big gamble. It's like you know when you sell, hey, this is a bold move, Cotton. Let's see how it works out for you, because mm-hmm. this supposes that there is appetite for this. Now, this type of move can literally start hurting him because people in Quebec are going, no, 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 we do not want to talk about this. We finally put this to bed. Like just, if that sentiment comes up, he's just killed his political career. Now, he's also might be planning on the fact that he might have a dip as a result of this, but he's got two years to pump that political fentanyl into the bloodstream of the province of being under an oppressive regime that seeks to crush them and will not stop until they are completely assimilated. This is very, very, very dangerous. It's exterminalist rhetoric. It's bad. It's very bad. So, um, if you're paying, paying attention to, to what's, these are little movements, little flames, embers, that are happening in other parts of the country, or like if you're living in BC and you never get any Quebec news, you might never hear this. And then all of a sudden, like a year and a half later, what, what the hell, how did that? This is where it starts, my friends. When he made that speech, that was the day it started. Let's pay attention. <clears throat> Eyes wide open. All right, Mr. Grizzly, do we have a show? We do indeed. All right, kids and cubs. That's the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show. We hope that you love listening to us because we love making this for you. Remember, sharing is caring and word of mouth is priceless. So please tell your peeps and poops all about us. Yay. And uh, we saw that a lot of people uh, scanned some QR codes during the show. Thank you so very much. If you would like to make sure that you do not miss an episode, you don't have to. Thanks to the fabulous, feisty, and fierce, the Ray Girl. Did I say fabulous? Mm-hmm. Yes, because she's fabulous as well. Mm-hmm. If you scan that QR code that's right under my chin, that will take you right there. That's to our pod page, podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver, lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words. And if you clip skip if you click subscribe there, when we have something fresh off the bandwidth, we will come directly to you. And if you would like to support us in other ways, Kit Elaine, right on time. I do not know how you do this every morning, but boom. Have a beyond awesome day, everyone. And remember to smash the button before you leave. Please do go to our True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated YouTube page. Like, share, subscribe. All our buttons. Click them, lick them. Flick them. We're happy. It makes us happy. It really does. Give us a little happy. Click subscribe. And if you would like to make sure that uh, we remain hydrated for the entire weekend so that we... uh, First of all, we've got podcast coming on Saturday, but so, but if you want to make sure that we remain hydrated all the way to Monday, well then you have to go to the emergency hydration fund at our coffee page, coffee, ko-fi.com slash eager beaver, lowercase letters, all in one word. Or if you scan the QR code by Mr. Grizzly's head, if you're watching, there you go. <laughs> Cassie licked it in front of the cowboy. <laughs> Good stuff. Um, if you go there and you would like to make a contribution uh, to help us produce uh, the show and put it on the air for you, I absolutely would be most grateful. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart. <sighs> Remember, democracy is something that you do. So if you live in the province of Alberta, you've got three more days to register to be able to vote in the NDP leadership race. The registration closes on the 22nd, so please make sure. And I believe that the first debate, I believe, uh, it will be the 25th in Lethbridge. I may be wrong on that, but uh, the debates will be coming soon. Um, so please, please, please uh, do that from the Beaver Lodge. This is your eager beaver saying, it could be a tough world out there. So please be kind to and gentle with yourself. And uh, Mr. Grizzly, do you have some words of wisdom? 
Please. Uh, yeah. Remember to breathe. No matter how stressed you may get, deep cleansing breaths will help calm you down very, very quickly. And that is necessary in stressful times like these. When there's war raging, when there's politicians lying to us every day and getting away with it, remember to breathe. All right. Mr. Grizzly, please roll the... You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, the Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. <laughs>